Get with you via text if we need to.
Welcome, everybody, to the very first Tech Talks. It's a beautiful, beautiful Monday evening here in Nashville, Tennessee. Yay! It is. Hey, Jeff Barry. Hey, Maris Macellis. <laughs> and by the way, if you haven't figured it out yet, TEC stands for Tennessee Environmental Council. We're a nonprofit organization founded in 1970. I'm CEO and Maris. I'm a board member of the Tennessee Environmental Council and a host of the CRZ Critical Root Zone podcast. Yes, and an advocate for many good things that we're going to be talking about tonight as well. And we're really excited uh, to be able to share a bit of our mission and vision with all you here tuning in tonight and or watching this on um, the recording later. Hopefully, indefinitely, we'll keep this up on YouTube. But we do um, want to talk about briefly how the event is going to come down tonight. And Tennessee Environmental Council's mission is improving, helping people uh, and communities improve our environment. And improvement is key. Um, and it's something we can all be part of. And we're hoping that tonight, through the speakers we have lined up tonight, amazing, inspiring, and leading edge speakers, people that have devoted their lives and careers to the betterment of humanity and the environment. So yeah. it's a real treat to have them here yeah. tonight. Yeah, we're going to be talking about three big topics, thriving habitats, circular economy, and climate balance. That's right. Yeah. And kind of talking about what those things mean, right, Jeff? What is climate balance for those who who haven't heard that term before? Well, you know, life on planet Earth depends on the balance between the energy coming in and going out and the temperature of our planet and the composition of our atmosphere. Yeah. That is a delicate, it's a powerful balance. And climate balance allows us to continue to thrive. Yeah, a thriving, thriving habitats is exactly what it what it's what it sounds like, thriving habitats. And then we've got the last one, circular economy. Talking yeah. about circular, right? Circular. And and thriving habitats is for animals, plants, and people. It's for all of us uh, to thrive. And so we're going to have a couple of speakers on that topic tonight. In the circular economy, right now, we are predominantly living under a linear economy where right. we mine materials from the earth, create products, and then throw them in the trash into the landfill. Doesn't go anywhere. And never to be seen again. But we can create a circular system where we reuse and recycle items as over many times as again. possible, over and over and over again. And it reduces the amount of pollution, energy required. It gives people jobs. So we'll be hearing about these three topics tonight. Where about that? And I'm really Yay. excited to be able to introduce Amory Lovins, uh, the first on our lineup tonight. And I've been a fan of Amory and his teachings for most of my adult life since I was a college student at UCLA in the Environmental Studies program. A hundred years ago, right? It's a few. It's the last century for sure. <laughs> And uh, Amory has been at it longer than I have, way longer, and and uh, has an incredible lesson about how we can be doing things differently uh, that have a radical difference in the impact we make on the planet. Uh, Amory is a writer, a physicist, an energy policy guru. The favorite nickname I have seen for Amory on the internet is the Einstein of energy efficiency. Ooh, it's a nice so. nickname to have. I think we should just go ahead and hand it over to Amory. Yay, Amory! And get started. Yes, take it away. No problem. <laughs> We're all learning how to appease the technology gods. Fantastic. Ninety, about two thirds of it through smarter technologies, is now supporting more energy services than oil does, and yet we've barely begun to harness efficiency. If the United States' total energy use 
had kept growing in lockstep with GDP since 1975, Americans would have used this much energy. But instead, we cut that use by so far 61% with huge cumulative savings equivalent to 28 years of current use. And meanwhile, <clears throat> renewable output doubled. That's wonderful. But you notice it starts from a smaller base, it grew less, and it has 28 times less cumulative impact than the savings. Renewables still get virtually all the headlines because they're visible, while energy is invisible, and the energy you don't use is almost unimaginable. Hey, Amory, can you hear me? But saved can energy did at least half the global decarbonization of the past 20 years, and it's set to repeat or exceed that success in the coming decades. A little more history. Around 1975, <clears throat> U.S. government and industry yeah, all talk. said that primary energy hey, productivity. Amory, Amory, I want to interrupt is, you for a second. Um, we are not seeing your slides. I want to make sure we capture the, the information. Oh, for heaven's sake. The dang technology okay. gods. Okay. The points are well, well taken. Let me, if we want to see the that's slides. probably my fault when I <laughs> changed decks. I probably forgot to uh, reshare the screen. So I'll that's fix that right excellent. now. Ooh. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, yeah. We weren't sure if we and, yeah, there we go. And Looking for it. Okay. Wait for it. So oh, just there, to, there to show go. the graph again that I just showed you, uh, <clears throat> instead of using that much energy, we use that much, saving this much cumulatively, which is 28 times as much as the cumulative increase in renewable supplies. Okay, now a little more history. <clears throat> Around 1975, <clears throat> U.S. government and industry all said that uh, what's called primary energy productivity, that is how much economic activity, how much GDP we produce per unit of total energy used, that that could never go up. That was their view of what was possible. A year later, I heretically suggested that our energy productivity or efficiency could go up 257% the next 50 years. Well, so far it's risen 154% in 46 years. But just the innovations already added by 2010 can raise our energy productivity by another threefold, twice what I originally thought, and at a third of the real cost. And yet today that looks conservative because optimizing buildings and vehicles and factories as whole systems, not as piles of little parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings. And that can turn diminishing returns into increasing returns. So the more you buy, the cheaper it gets. Vigorously applied, this could roughly quintuple the world's energy productivity over the coming decades. Now, how to do that is described in this peer-reviewed paper a few years ago, and it explains why making energy savings several fold bigger can actually cost less because it's not about adding stuff, but taking stuff out. It doesn't use more devices, but fewer. It doesn't use fancier devices, but simpler, but more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. We're used to resources like copper ore bodies and oil reservoirs, finite and depletable assemblages of atoms. But energy efficiency resources are different. They're infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. Let me give you a few examples. Here in my house, 7,100 feet up in the Rockies near Aspen, it's already snowing up here, uh, temperatures used to dip as low as minus 47 F. But our house does no combustion. That's so 20th century. Super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and big super windows that insulate like 16 or even 22 sheets of glass look like two and cost less than three, those components make this building 99% passive solar heated, 1% active solar heated. The super efficiency added less construction cost than eliminating the heating system subtracted. So we save 99% of the space and water heating energy, 90% of the household electricity and half the water, and that all paid for itself in 10 months in 1983. Today's technologies are better and cheaper. Now, this house is wrapped around a central atrium that you saw behind me when I was being introduced. It's seen here in a February snowstorm. And so far it's produced 80 passive solar banana crops. 
Uh, our house helped inspire several hundred thousand European buildings, which like ours are passive, no heating, roughly normal construction cost. And analogous designs work fine in hot, muggy Bangkok. Almost everyone on earth lives in a climate between those of Bangkok and old snowmass. Integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure. So this white arch at the top of the upper middle photo actually has 12 different functions, but only one cost. Now, please follow the green numbers as I show you a few examples of how integrative design is improving. It led our Empire State Building retrofit, save 38%, later 43% of its energy use with a three-year payback back in 2010. Three years later, our cost-effective retrofit saved 70% in making this half century old government complex in Denver more efficient than what was then the best new US office, which in turn is only a third as efficient as RMI's net positive, no mechanicals, passive house up here near my home. And then there's this Bavarian building, Southern Germany, reportedly using two fifths less energy still. Yet all these technologies existed about two decades ago. What's mainly improved is not so much technology as design how we put the pieces together. In Europe, industrializing mass retrofits to net zero energy, so the building produces each year at least as much energy as it uses, and streamlining finance and soft costs is now getting cheap enough to finance entirely from saved energy, while extending building life by decades and improving amenity and health and value. So this whole retrofit, <clears throat> like a tea cozy around your house, has even been demonstrated to be installable in a single day while you're off at work. Now it's being tested in the US. Similar methods are expected to cut energy costs 80% at emissions to zero in nine old Brooklyn apartment buildings. Like brownstones. So there's a lot we could do to fix up old buildings. In big commercial buildings, we can readily and profitably at least triple the efficiency of conventional cooling systems, but those may just have become obsolete. Thanks to a revolutionary advance just demonstrated a few years ago in sweltering Singapore, where it turned out that purely radiative cooling could keep people comfortable outdoors without moving, drying, or cooling the air. Instead, in an open-ended shaded pavilion, kind of like a bus stop shelter, this experiment cooled people just by absorbing far infrared radiation from their bodies into vertical panels cooled by surface tubes circulating slightly cooled water and uh, shielded from the humid air by thin plastic films that let the infrared mostly through. And as <clears throat> uh, the extended data show, radiant temperatures in the panel around 73 to 77 F and to lurk pretty to an F. 80% relative humidity. Such mild cooling can often be done passively with no electricity by special surfaces that radiate infrared into the sky so they feel cool to the touch when they're sitting in the midday sun. What about inside the buildings? Well, the Swiss fist size heat pump can deliver six to 15 units of hot water from each unit of electricity. This dramatically more efficient and safe and superior Swiss electric cooking system uses vacuum insulated pots to cook with two and a half to four odd times less electricity than induction cooktops. So both of these are several fold more efficient than what's now on the US market. <clears throat> what about industry, which uses half the world's energy and electricity? Well, my team's latest 60 odd billion dollars worth of industrial redesigns typically found 30 to 60% energy savings retrofitting old factories and paying back in a few years, far outperforming the orange zone in the upper left, where most energy service companies deliver disintegrated design. Or in new industrial projects, integrative design generally yielded 40 to 90 odd percent energy savings with lower than normal capital cost. We just rethought process design and found big savings in traditional, but often poorly designed auxiliary systems. Thus, most electricity runs motors. Half of that, that motor torque runs pumps and fans. But just better design of pipes and ducts 
can save 80 to 90 plus percent of the friction and therefore of the pump and fan power. If everybody did this, it could save about a fifth of the world's electricity or half the coal fired electricity with paybacks typically under a year in retrofit and instant in new build. But this isn't yet in any standard engineering textbook, official study, industry forecast, or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology. It's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a way to scale rapid change. To wring out friction, we simply use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps, and to eliminate elbows, right angle bends, and their friction, we lay out the pipes first, then the equipment, laying out supply pipes as if they were drains. We bend mines, not pipes. We can also save a lot of industrial energy by saving the energy intensive materials that industry makes. In two papers last year, I compiled convincing literature on how smarter structural design can profitably save at least half the world's cement and steel that now release 15% of the global CO2. For example, substituting tension for compression structures typically looks better, costs less, and uses about one eighth the tons. Pouring concrete into curvy fabric forms, not rigid prismatic forms, can often save over half the concrete by putting strength and stiffness only where they're needed. And then the weight savings compound, they snowball because you need less strength to hold up less weight. An airy 3D printed bridge can carry mainly its users, while massive concrete structures support mainly their own weight. This beautiful stainless steel bridge in Holland was 3D printed. Or a five centimeter thick folded concrete floor slab or a shallow vaulted arch can replace a 30 centimeter thick flat slab that costs less and it saves three fourths of the materials. Well then, using thin floor slabs, uh, you can save another 15% of the core structural material and set uh, three quarters of the energy in a new mid or high rise building while increasing the net rentable space by a stunning 55% as in the Singapore building in the upper right. How do you do that? Well, it's called the three for two concept. You design out, you see at the far lower left, a uh, vertical meter or so height of mechanical platinum at each story. And then you can fit three stories with normal nine foot two inch ceiling height into the vertical space that we now need for two stories. Cost, complexity, and time fall dramatically. Everything gets better. Why would you ever want to build the old way? Now, even without much integrative design, U.S. electricity use could shrink 25% by 2050, despite all electric autos and a 2.6-fold bigger economy. Quadrupled electric efficiency like that would save kilowatt hours at an average cost just a tenth what we pay for kilowatt hours. So we should have bought a lot more efficiency than that. In contrast, the most popular model of the challenges of vast renewable and power line installations uh, assumes two to four times less efficiency uh, than we found. Hardly any official energy models compete or compare efficient use with new supply, so they assume far too little efficiency. Integrated design could also make automobiles several fold more efficient even before they're electrified making their electrification faster and cheaper. <clears throat> you see, most of the energy you need to move a car is caused by its weight, and saving one unit of energy at the wheels leverages four or five units of fuel saved in the tank because you don't need to waste three or four more units getting the energy to the wheels. So taking weight out is crucial, and this carbon fiber lightweight electric car that I drive turned out to be profitable from the first to the last of the quarter million units that BMW sold over the past nine years. That's because the carbon fiber, supposedly too expensive, was actually paid for by needing fewer batteries to propel the lighter weight car. And fewer batteries recharge faster with less electricity and less infrastructure. The saved weight snowballs spectacularly. The assembly of this car saves two thirds of the normal capital and water and half the energy space and time. It also eliminates the two hardest steps in making the car. It's much better for the workers and the quadruple efficiency to the equivalent of 124 miles a gallon comes without compromise and with many driver advantages. My favorite is uh, 
uh, half normal turn radius. Now, that's all about to change too, because two hypercars planned to enter the market this year, both from firms I advise, are going to change the game again. Most drivers will not need to recharge this two seat electric three wheeler because the solar cells on top of it capture enough energy to drive 25 to 40 miles a day. It's as if your present car magically added a couple of gallons of fuel to the tank every day you park it outside. To make a long road trip, you can quickly recharge the tiny batteries with household electricity for ranges up to a thousand miles. So my BMW and Tesla electric cars are among the most efficient now sold, but this two-seater will nearly triple their efficiency to the equivalent of 343 miles a gallon. The composite body looks very crashworthy. Then there's the Dutch firm Lightyear with a four-wheel, 450 mile range, light aerodynamic car uh, with five square meters of solar cells and 251 miles a gallon equivalent of efficiency. Um, uh, so that could add eight miles of range per hour in the sun. Thus the charging infrastructure that others have to pay for, these super efficient vehicles aim to bypass and even they can be further improved. Now the same physics and the same business logic also apply to trucks, planes, and ships. We help Walmart's heavy truck fleet save half its fuel per case, and that included smarter logistics, but current technology alone can profitably make heavy trucks two to four times more efficient. That plus the three to five fold more efficient airplanes in the bottom row designed a decade ago at Boeing, NASA, and MIT could move nearly a trillion dollars net present value from oil companies' top line to Americans' pockets and help get the world off oil, including Russian oil. Now, the decade since has yielded even bigger potential savings at even lower cost. Tesla's battery electric heavy truck is being customer tested with mass production postponed to next year so battery and car production can catch up. It'll more than triple efficiency with 40% sleeker aerodynamics, light weighting that offsets battery weight, and a two-year payback at the pre-war U.S. fuel prices. Then there's this flight-tested air taxi that can fly nonstop from Nashville to Rome with a sixth the operating cost and an eighth the fuel use of a business jet. And that's before it switches to hydrogen or electricity. A bigger version already designed uh, <clears throat> could uh, hold well over 20 seats. Uh, that's ideal uh, for point-to-point -point route architectures that are rapidly emerging. And it looks set to blow up aviation's business models. We also now <coughs> have learned how to make airplane structures 98% lighter than the metal ones we fly in today. So there's a lot more innovation where this came from. Thus, the oil and gas reserves, unsellable for competitive reasons, look bigger than the reserves unburnable for climate reasons, putting oil owners even more at risk for market competition than from climate regulation. The cost of getting autos completely off oil has fallen from about $18 per se barrel 11 years ago to under $7 a barrel today, heading below zero in the next few years. So oil just became uncompetitive even at low prices before it became unavailable even at high prices. In using electricity and fuels, technology and design are bringing speed to efficiency. The latest revolution, for example, in lighting technology is going to save an eighth of global electricity because in a decade, LEDs got 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. LEDs backwards and inside out are PVs, photovoltaics, whose best unsubsidized prices just fell from over 50 to 3 to 2 cents a kilowatt hour, even to 1 cent, and similarly for wind power in aqua. And meanwhile, the whole electricity system is starting to become decarbonized, decentralized, digitized, democratized. As Jeff Bladen said, we're shifting from forecasting demand and scheduling supply of electricity to forecasting supply, renewable supply, and scheduling demand. Indeed, powerful disruptors are now converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. <clears throat> These eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse move fast. They don't just add, they exponentiate. They're not lone wolves. 
They hunt in packs. They multiply quickly, and they can gobble half of utility revenues in this decade. Together, they're creating an alien competitive landscape faster than most utility cultures can cope. Eight years ago, all central power plants were called dinosaurs, and the full quote was, too big, too inflexible, not even relevant for backup power in the long run. Who do you suppose said that? It wasn't Greenpeace. It was Union Bank of Switzerland. And now a whole new wave of Pac-Man is coming over the hill and more behind them. Variable renewables, photovoltaics and wind power do require careful grid balancing on multiple timescales. Fortunately, we have not just one way bulk storage in Magenta, but about 10 carbon free ways to make the grid reliable and resilient as it becomes renewable. I've sketched them here in rough order of in our actual cost will vary, but bulk storage, like giant battery, comes last, not first. We needn't wait for a storage miracle, though some are emerging, and the market isn't waiting. Easing our supply task, uh, <clears throat> the first two boxes on the left, which you might call megawatts and flexawatts, that's efficient use and demand response, those are both about three times bigger than had been thought, and yet cheaper. Indeed, this whole portfolio is so ample that its costliest grid balancer, the giant batteries at the far right, do not actually look necessary. And to see why, consider Texas, whose grid has no big hydro dams and is 99% isolated from the rest of the country. A uh, 2050 summer week of expected Texas loads can get a lot smaller and less peaky with profitably efficient use. Then we can make 86% of the annual electricity with a mixture of wind and solar cells. You see, they're quite variable. And make the other 14% from dispatchable renewables that we can have whenever we want. This 100% renewable supply can then match the load by putting the surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth buying anyway, ice storage air conditioning and smart bidirectional charging of electric vehicles. Then we can recover that energy when needed and fill the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. Well, then you have 100% renewable electricity every hour of the year with no bulk storage and with only about 5% left over to make hydrogen or ammonia to decarbonize other sectors. So the economics should be excellent even at today's prices. Some grid operators are now doing just such choreography every day. Germany, Britain, Ireland are all about half renewably powered. Denmark expected to hit 86% renewable power last year. The stats aren't out yet. And already uh, they and some other European countries with modest or no hydropower need about half or meet about half to three fourths or more of their annual electric needs from renewables. And yet they added no bulk storage and they have superior reliability. For Denmark and Germany, it's over five times as good as ours. The 99.999% reliable former East German utility, Fimsi Hertz, was 62% renewably powered last year. They're targeting 100% renewables, all reliably integrated 10 years from now. So as my colleague Clay Stranger says, the operators have learned to run these grids the way the conductor leads a symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time but the ensemble continuously makes beautiful music. What if we combine renewables with efficient and timely use? Well, 11 years ago, RMI's business and design book, Reinventing Fire, rigorously showed how to triple U.S. energy efficiency and quintuple renewables by 2050 at historically reasonable speed. So by then, we would need no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, and at least a third less natural gas while saving $5 trillion in a lump sum today, assuming all externalities are worth zero, a conservatively low estimate, we could grow GDP 2.6 fold, strengthen national security, and cut fossil carbon emissions by 82 to 86%. Yet we would need no new inventions to do this, no acts of Congress, but with smart city and state policies that could be led by business for profit. You might wonder how that's doing in the marketplace. Well. The first 11 years of this 40-year journey are pretty well on track, green actual versus blue proposed, I think largely because the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. 
These best buys also turn out to be the most effective solutions to big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And if you like any of reinventing fire's outcomes, you can support the transition without having to like every outcome or agree about which outcome is most important. Focusing on outcomes, not motives, can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. Now, stimulated by those U.S. findings, at the G20 six years ago, China's National Development and Reform Commission published this roadmap for China's energy revolution, detailing how China can save over $3 trillion, run a seven-fold bigger economy in 2050 than in 2010, but using today's energy seven times more productively, emit 42% less carbon, burn 80% less coal, and get 13 times more GDP from each ton of fossil carbon. That roadmap strongly informed the 13th five-year plan, whose energy authors happen to be our steering committee, and then the 14th plan continues this line. So extrapolating these on-track U.S. and adopted Chinese and similar European findings to the other half of the world could achieve the minimal Paris Agreement two-degree climate target, about $18 trillion cheaper than business as usual. Then reinvesting some of that in natural systems carbon removal could get us to the aspirational and necessary one and a half degree Glasgow goal with trillions of dollars left over and huge progress on the sustainable development goals. Making climate protection not costly but profitable should also simplify the politics. <clears throat> now here's the bigger picture. The climate science models have conservatively understated the speed and the runaway potential of climate change. The climate choice models, though, conservatively understated, at least equally, what we could do to stop climate change. Offsetting those two biases, what Jeremy Grantham calls the race of our lives, is very much on. Despair and complacency are equally unwarranted. Global CO2 emissions have actually fallen a little in the past decade as energy savings and carbon-free supply growth average roughly the pace we need to sustain for two degrees, or half the pace we need for one and a half degrees. So now we have to accelerate. And a powerful tool to do that is capital market dynamics. Feeling the threat, the incumbent energy suppliers have understandably focused on the need for price to exceed costs. This year, that's not a problem, but uh, previously it was. But many seem to have forgotten the other part of the business condition, that value must exceed price. If competitors offer a superior value proposition and run off with your revenues, it doesn't matter if you can profitably sell what your ex-customers are no longer buying. In 1900 in Manhattan, he had to look hard for the first car. Anyone see it? There it is. 13 years later, you had to look even harder to find the last horse. Ford's Model T got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car-owning households soared from 8 to about 60% in a decade. Three quarters finished by a GM and DuPont Innovation car loans. Well, today our photovoltaic modules just got 80% cheaper in five years. Three quarters of rooftop solar is innovatively financed. Ford's and Edison's industries are merging to eat Rockefeller's industry. So as you see in this stunning pace of transformation, that, that pace is set not by incumbents, but by insurgents who are not inhibited by the incumbents' legacy assets or business models or cultures. Moreover, investors flee before customers do because capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. And once they think you're in or even headed for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and invest in your successors. Trillions of dollars have already prudently fled the fossil fuel industries as they hemorrhage capital, talent, and political clout. Late last year, the world's top 16 listed hydrocarbon companies combined were worth less than Apple, and most or all of the world's significant automakers combined were worth less than Tesla. Investment analyst Kings Bill Bond explains this brutal logic of the capital markets. He says any fast-growing challenger will rapidly take all the growth in a slow-growing market. As a rule of thumb, incumbent sales will peak when the challenger gets to around 3% market share, as happened in these examples. That's because most, markers, and most investors seek growth, not just size, and they try to sell just before sales peak because then stagnation strands assets and competition drops prices. 
So that's why the coal industry by 2020 had lost three quarters of its global market value, 99% in the U.S. And before Putin's war, this collapsing value was spreading to oil and coming next for gas. And so it will again when the dust settles. We're passing big peaks one after another, peak nuclear uh, power generation, peak coal use, peak auto sales, peak fossil fuel power have already happened. Fueled autos are now in their fifth year of shrinking sales because electric cars took more than all the growth. The International Energy Agency uh, <clears throat> says that the 2020 pandemic slump uh, undid the previous four years of energy growth and the previous uh, uh, nine years of CO2 growth. But meanwhile, renewables grew 45% faster. They added an extraordinary 278 billion watts. So by the time demand recovers, if it does, renewables will probably have expanded enough, looks like they already have, to supply any future growth, tipping fossil fuels into permanent decline. Therefore, peak oil, peak fossil fuels, and their peak CO2 emissions probably already happened in 2019. Now, this respected 2020 forecast um, will help you visualize these shifts. The bottom three wedges, coal and black, oil and red, gas and gray, stagnated before the pandemic. Then in 2020, the pandemic's economic shock shriveled fossil fuels, but renewables, mainly wind and blue and solar and yellow, grabbed the capital and grew faster. Total energy use can still go up a little more, but wind and solar will supply more than all growth, turning coal, oil, and gas into sunset industries whose capital flees to efficiency of renewables. And those reinforce each other because efficient use makes renewables gain share faster and efficiency outcompetes fossil fuels sooner. In the past decade, world energy use, the very top of the graph, grew only half as fast as it had in the previous decade. Further speeding energy savings could accelerate this self-reinforcing capital flight from incumbents to insurgents. And some of that speed may come from deeper, cheaper energy savings through integrative design. Its contagious, visually transmissible ideas might spread at the speed of YouTube and Twitter, perhaps even rivaling the speed of scaling solar power. And Putin just sped the energy transformation by blowing up the fossil fuel era and spiking fossil fuel prices as if we just got a huge carbon tax. This conceptual sketch shows how first the pandemic shifted the world's energy use trajectory to a bumpy plateau, then a gentle decline, but now Putin's war has triggered a European and American-led response, likely to trigger a steep decline like the plummeting blue curve running toward the lower right. So Putin has set inexorably in motion all the outcomes he dreaded, but he's also sped the end of the fossil fuels that underpin his power. If we grasp this unique opportunity as Europe is now doing with impressive focus and resolve, then Ukraine's agony will not have been in vain. One last thought, this global energy transformation isn't just fundamental, it's elemental. The first industrial revolution was the age of carbon, creating our prosperity and the world's mightiest industries from coal and oil and gas. But now that obsolete age of carbon is giving way to the modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecom software, turn people from isolated to network, systems from dumb to smart, grids from analog to digital, and potentially from dirigiste to democratized. Silicon power electronics make electricity interconvertible and precisely applicable, replacing fiery molecules with obedient electrons. And silicon power cells, and solar cells, enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. So our responsibility and opportunity is to help enable the new energy system, not protect the old, to build back better, to move fast and fix things. So the global energy transformation can move at the pace and cost of design and of software, not of infrastructure and can be not constrained by the inertia of incumbents, but sped by the ambition of insurgents, like many of you. Uh, thank you for your good work and your kind attention, and 
because I think we missed it the first time. I'll just put the title slide back up where you can see it. Thank you. Let's see what's on your minds. Thank you, Amory. Wow. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was inc incredibly eye-opening. And thank you for that. I, I We do have some questions. Um, first question, we wanted to know, since you've been taking, you've been giving this information out for 50 years and it's obviously doable, what has been holding us back? Why haven't these ideas been put into place sooner? <clears throat> well, a lot of people don't realize this is possible. And if you don't think it's possible, you probably won't try to do it or believe it when other people try to do it. Um, there are, of course, a lot of obstacles in policy and in public understanding uh, put up by those who would really rather keep selling us uh, what they sell us now. Um, and uh, there are also, to be fair, about 60 or 80 well-known obstacles or market failures, actually, in buying energy efficiency. For example, uh, why should you fix up the house if the landlord owns it? Why should the landlord fix it if you pay the utilities? We pay our architects and engineers for what they save, not what they spend. In the majority of the United States, we reward electric and gas companies for selling you more energy and penalize them for cutting your bill. Uh, each of these uh, dozens of obstacles can actually be turned into a business opportunity, but that requires careful attention, relentless patience, uh, <clears throat> and uh, meticulous uh, care with details. Th thank you, Amory. Now, we had several other questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask one more, and then we're going to get back onto our agenda because um, we, we want to hear the other great speakers. But I, I love how you um, showed clearly that, you know, I always learned that peak oil would happen uh, because we, we run out of oil in the ground. But you showed that uh, peak oil and peak coal took place or it happened because and peak nuclear because uh, wind and solar and other renewables and efficiency are outperforming those older energy resources. And I think that is a powerful perspective. Scaling, which used to be the third biggest industry in the country, we ran out of customers before we ran out of whales. Uh, and I think a lot of utilities will be surprised uh, when customers uh, figure out as they're starting to do that uh, there's no law that says you have to buy all that energy. You can, you can use it more productively. You can make your own, you can trade it with each other. Uh, and that's again, decentralized, democratized, distributed, decentralized, uh, a decarbonized model is, is what is spreading so rapidly now, basically through market forces, not forced by policy, but led by business for profit. That's exactly the way I'd, I'd like to see it. Uh, and I think a lot of people of different political views could get behind it once they understand that that's what's actually happening. Let's try a little experiment. Uh, what fraction of the world's net additions of electric generating capacity would you guess is now renewable? In other words, how much of the growth in capacity are renewables now providing? I would, I would assume that growth in, in uh, new capacity is largely renewables, um, even though it's still a small percentage of the total share of generation, um, maybe in the 20 to 30 percent range. And they guessed it was maybe 20 percent. One of them thought 10. It's actually about 95 percent. You know, the revolution happened. Sorry if you missed it. That's great. Thank you so much, Amory. Now, Thank you, Amory. We, uh, um, for all those who have questions, we are documenting all the questions that have been uh, coming in for Amory, and we will um, we'll, we'll do something with those at a future date. Uh, maybe send them over to Amory, and you can do with them what you want. But w the information is powerful, and thank you so much for being a, a guru and an advocate for decades, Amory. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. Next. So next, well, we have uh, Gil Huff, and, and he's going to have uh, some of the similar information because this is a, the climate balance portion of our evening and showing that there, there are solutions that are underway to get us back into climate balance. And Gil is a director of the Tennessee Solar Energy Industry Association. And Gil and I have known each other for about 20 plus years, uh, going back to the kilowatt hours documentary days. But it's great to see you, Gil. Thank you for being here. And what do you have to share with us tonight? Well. 
Yeah, I'm gonna zoom in on what's happening with. Uh, let me let me see. Can you see my presentation? Oh, there we go. Great. Um, so as you know, it's great to reconnect with Jeff, and I'm excited to be here today to share this information. Uh, just said, I'm executive director of Tennessee of the Tennessee Solar Energy Industry Association. So our members represent the industry. I have large manufacturing members in Tennessee and mom and pops, guys that you know literally work out of their garage. It's a wide, diverse membership. And there's a lot of exciting things happening um, across the industry. Um, so the biggest news, and I just want to cover this, is IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was really a climate bill that passed recently. Um, it is, won't be fully implemented for a while, but it's, I just want to say it changes the game. Um, you know, renewables is already growing like gangbusters. And with this, it is just, it's throwing, you know, gas out of fire. It is remarkable. And what it most exciting with the new legislation does is it really provides benefits to doing the right thing. Uh, for, for solar companies or wind companies, carbon technologies, carbon-free technologies that pay high wages, well, you get a higher rate of uh, investment tax credit or PTC. If you work in an energy community, a landfill, if you you know use domestic content, it really uh, encourages the kind of things that the solar industry has always wanted to do, but sometimes made us unprofitable, an inability to compete if we were too good of citizens. That's got the nature of capitalism. Um, but now with this new legislation that is now law, um, when you do these positive things, uh, it uh, benefits you. You get more. So I think we're going to see not just a lot more solar in, in Tennessee and the Tennessee Valley, but a lot of projects that will be benefiting low-income communities. We're going to see more manufacturing, more good jobs. We are in a great role, and I think uh, this is just going to be really even more exciting. Um, so this quick outline of the presentation today. Uh, I'm going to go kind of over the, the different buckets of the solar market here in Tennessee, just kind of give you a sense. Um, and so I'm frankly using a presentation I, I generally use, but normally in, in, uh, industry type groups or utilities. So it really is not a state of Tennessee market. We really represent uh, the Tennessee Valley. The TVA sets it, uh, the market here in Tennessee. Um, so where is solar today? Uh, you know, about a thousand gigawatts contracted. These numbers are a little outdated, actually. We got we have a little more than this now, but it gives you a sense. And about there is about three gigawatts fully contracted and going through some level of development in the Tennessee Valley. Line. That's a lot of power, way more than we've ever had. There are projects happening throughout the state. In fact, we're seeing a lot of issues right now as communities that never had any real solar in them before are now struggling with how to permit and, and deal with the solar bonanza that's now hitting Tennessee. Um, so first of all, we talk about solar. There's the big stuff. Um, there in and that's directly contracted with TVA. That's normally for the Green Invest program. So Facebook, or Google pays extra, um, and to be 100% renewable. That's most of the you know their goals is 100% renewable. So if they come, TVA promises to generate all their power. Ford has got some you know with the blue, new Blue Oval facility has remarkable goals with sustainability for their new EV plant. Um, in that kind of thing, I have to say that those businesses are driving the market. They've really created the large scale market here in, in TVA. Uh, and there's so much going on, TVA can't keep up with it. So it's a very exciting place to be at. Um, so I do always want to, you know, Tennessee Valley, which is the market, you know, which does include parts of North Georgia, Alabama, you know, Southern Kentucky and, and Northeast Mississippi um, has a lot of solar going in right now. Here's just some previous numbers. 
Um, some of these are now operating. Some of these are still going in construction. Just to give you a sense of some of the projects, the large scale projects that are happening. What's also exciting, and and Emory mentioned this, is there is a lot of storage with these projects. You know, you might have a 200, you know, megawatt solar project like the Golden Triangle Solar Project that has a 50 megawatt hour battery attached. So that concern about, hey, what happens, you know, our peak power goes an hour after the sun goes down or it starts early. Well, we actually, that technology has solved, but that is actually being implemented today in the Tennessee Valley. And frankly, TVA is ahead of the curve because they are a little bit of a late adopter. Um, they are able to take advantage of a lot of technologies that have been tried in other places that were maybe more expensive, but now they're cost competitive. And frankly, TVA is doing this not because they've suddenly become climate champions. I'm not saying they're against climate action, but they're doing it because solar and storage combined is the low uh, cost solution. Um, so it's exciting. Uh, we are in gang time. We, I've got so many projects going on that it is just a great time to be in. Um, another, which in many ways, a lot of people find is even more exciting is the flexibility, generation flexibility project. TVA is part of extending long-term contracts that they did because of the changing marketplace. So they look, if we're getting to longer-term contracts with you guys, we'll also give you the ability to do self-generation. Um, and that is really exciting because those are like, so if you live in NES or Middle Tennessee or in KUB, that is projects that they will do either in their territory or some new changing roles nearby in partnership with some other LPCs, local power companies, people you pay businesses to, or you pay your bills to. Um, and so there are a lot of, we, I'm getting so many questions. We're doing so much partnership with our local electric uh, munis and electric co-ops. That is very exciting. Um, the, the picture I do want to recognize, we have an annual conference. Uh, it's actually coming up, uh, starting, uh, welcome reception tomorrow night. So, uh, exciting times, but last year we recognized Appalachian Electric in, in Morristown for their joint project, a 25 megawatt project in their communities, meeting local needs built in their communities. Just uh, It is a very exciting um, um, program and I think is the kind of thing we want to see more of. Um, there is some changes happening. TVA board just approved, uh, you know, why this is fantastic. I mean, the contracts uh, that the local power companies are getting into can be offset from the power they normally would pay at the same rate that they would pay TVA. But the, these power contracts are cheaper because solar today is cheaper than what the utilities have been uh, traditionally been able to uh, generate power for with their old coal and natural gas prices. So when the local power company does go into the contracts, there's a downward pressure on rates. So even if you're not directly uh, involved in one of these projects in your community, because your local utility is buying it cheaper than they would buy it from TVA, it's pushing down on rates. So I mean, just win, win, win for everybody. TVA is seeing a lot of load growth, partly because of EVs uh, and growth in the valley. But at the same time, solar is coming in. Uh, local power companies are doing self-generation. It's just a, a very exciting time here in, in, in TVA. Um, nope, that, there we go. Um, so what about home? So that's, of course, I, you know, Solar is a huge fan on the local level, liking it to have it on your homes. And frankly, that's probably where we've struggled the most here, working with both the local power companies and TVA. We had a pretty good program for a long time, the Green Power Providers and Generation Partners programs, uh, but that ended a few years ago. And that's caused, frankly, a lot of issues, um, not so much the market. I'm, I have to say my solar companies that we represent in the residential market are still doing great. They've, they've changed as they've switched to behind the meter projects 
where they include storage on the home so you could offset at the retail rate as if you had net metering. Costs a little more, but also has a lot of benefits outside of money. Um, but local power companies have seen an influx of questionable promises by some companies who are you know, generally out of state or not members of Tennessee. And we're struggling with that. It's a grow, an industry that's growing so quickly has challenges. Uh, but we're working with TVA and the local power companies to come up with um, some options. There's the TVA Green Connect program, a quality installer network that's kind of designed to deal with that, but doesn't have the market driver for participation. So there are several local power companies that are working right now um, on how to maybe incentivize it, improve it. There's a lot of benefits to these homes that have battery storage. You can do you know, virtual power plants as they get large enough. So we're really hopeful that we have to kind of show that the utilities won't do so that's against their interest, but I really think they can see the benefit of these distributed systems and we just need to work with them to uh, show those financially. Um, so I did mention, uh, you know, I got to plug my own conference uh, that is this Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Tennessee Valley Solar Conference. It's an industry conference. It is kind of expensive to attend, uh, you know, but we get fantastic participation. I do have to say TVA partners, there'll be like 35 TVA staffers, anybody dealing with renewables, transmission studies, uh, we really get into the nitty gritty because we just focus, because TVA sets the rules. Unlike some solar conferences, we are really able to get into details. So we have you know, dynamic inverter study panels, things that are pretty boring, but really important uh, for uh, growth. I do want to you know, the biggest pushback, TVA wants as much renewable energy as we can provide. I mean, that's the situation right now. We're having, we're struggling uh, because there's been a lot of, you know, COVID supply chain issues and some other things. And, and now there's incredible demand because of this. If getting enough panels to build everything TVA wants. Our biggest problems right now is pushback, nimbyism, not my backyard and local, local communities. Um, we have two counties that have now put moratoriums on solar in them, Franklin and Greene County. Uh, we have another county looking at doing that. Uh, it's mostly not logical pushback, and we're just having to work with the key players for that. But I do want to go over a couple of myths that we're seeing Google out there more and more. Uh, you know, one of our lead, you know, really the lead large-scale developer in Tennessee, Silicon Ranch, has our big dog here in the Tennessee Valley based in Nashville. And they have a fantastic program where they co-locate, you know, sheep or, or um, other crops. And, in, in, you know, just because you have a, uh, put solar up in a farm does not actually mean it goes out of agricultural production. It just means you have to plan and design for that. You do have to plan and design for it ahead of time. But if you do that, it can be a great way of benefiting. In fact, a lot of times you're dealing with very poor soil, so it can be a great way to actually improve soil. Um, zoning, I, I hear that, you know, I always hear that zoning hurts local property values if you have a large scale solar in the neighborhood, but that is almost never true. Uh, it, it does not happen here. And um, uh, just that's just a myth. Um, now, there needs to be, you know, solar is not, you know, does everything needs to be done properly, proper setbacks and, and stuff. As long as they're reasonable, I do see some proposals in some counties where you have a three mile setback where you physically can never, have, it's basically a moratorium. But if you have a reasonable, you know, 50 foot setback and they have to have some plants and stuff and, or you have to have some, you know, uh, pollinator crops in there for bees and kind of stuff. We love doing this stuff and it's a marginal cost and it just makes it more of a win-win, which is really solar always should be a win-win for the, for economic development, for the local community and for TVA and the local power company. Um, it, again, another land use myth, solar is replacing cropland. 
you know, North Carolina, which is a much more advanced market than Tennessee, they're 10 years ahead of us. And they find out 0.28% of North Carolina cropland is used for their much larger market. They're, they already are what we hope to be in 10 years. It, it's really a myth. It's not that much land um, compared to the available cropland available. And a lot of times it is not even permanent. You can actually remove a solar farm in a couple of weeks. Now, you don't want to do that while you have a contract selling power. But, it, you know, cropland is not. Your, your prime farmland category is not changed by putting a normal solar project up. Um, it you, You're putting it right on top. You pull the piles. Up. It's, it's amazingly light footprint compared to almost anything. Residential neighborhood, putting a Walmart, golf course even will can destroy prime farmland. Solar does not. So really, uh, it's just a, a absolute fantastic uh, use of, of land. It's game busters. Every solar company I know of has hiring right now, um, and it's really uh, an exciting time. So, Jeff, uh, that's that's my presentation. Here are some sources. Uh, do we have any questions that um, anybody has thrown at me? Hey, Gil, that was fa fantastic and yeah. fabulous to, to see the lay of the land, the landscape of solar in Tennessee. And we're going to hold questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat of the YouTube uh, window there. Yeah. And we're going to go to our next speaker that yeah. Maris will introduce. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got an, an addition, last minute addition that's really important. His name is Brady Watson. He is the Civic Engagement Coordinator with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And we're really stoked to have him do a quick presentation for us. Brady, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> can y'all hear me? Brady, we can hear. Yes, you, you're here where all systems are go and we see you there. So and we can hear you. Thank you, Brady. Great. And you can see the slides as well. And there we're on. in slide action. OK, cool. Well, um, thank you all for having me. I'm really, uh, really grateful. As uh, as Mara said, my name is Brady and I do uh, some civic engagement and sort of member and volunteer outreach at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, which is a regional nonprofit based in Knoxville. And we do a lot of work with, with TVA. Um, this is going to be a bit of a juxtaposition to, to Gil's presentation for sure, but um, I certainly, there's a lot of agreement on the benefits and, you know, um, sort of necessities of solar for sure. So um, yeah, and I know I've got about five or so minutes, so I'll try to be quick. But um, a lot of this stuff is from a larger project called the Tennessee Valley Energy Democracy Movement. Um, so I just wanted to sort of give them a shout out. But um, of course, you know, a lot of the, the conversations tonight have been about climate and energy and electricity. And, um, you know, why does electricity matter in the climate crisis? Um, this is just a breakdown of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. And as you can see from, from this pie chart, electricity is a big chunk of our greenhouse gas emissions. So if we're going to confront the climate crisis and reduce emissions, the ele electricity sector is certainly um, a prime place to start. And so, um, you know, just a little bit of background. So um, I think, uh, you know, an area where Gil and I would certainly agree is that TVA has cut emissions quite a bit since 2005. They've cu cut emissions about 60%. Uh, which is great, you know, and that's something that they should be proud of and applauded for. Um, but some of their forward looking planning and, and actions are sort of um, counterintuitive to some of their own stated goals and what we know we need to do to reach net zero by 2050 and um, a zero carbon emission electric sector by 2035, which is what President Biden has has mandated or uh, placed in his executive order. So, the, the chart on the left here sort of shows TVA's historical emissions trajectory uh, with the blue line. <clears throat> and you can see a pretty steep reduction in those emissions, which I said, uh, which mentioned earlier, which is a great thing. Um, and then you see this sort of red line, which is kind of their current plan. And as you can see, it's, it's sort of out of line with a pathway to zero by 2035 um, and by 2050 even. So you know, TV has a goal of being at zero by 2050, but their current planning is not going to allow them to meet that. Um, in fact, if they continue their current decarbonization rate, they won't reach net zero until 2088, um, which is out of line with everything we know about the science. Um, this chart on the right here has a bit of a breakdown on their current energy mix, which is about 
uh, a lot of nuclear. Uh, they've got quite a bit of, of gas and little, they've cut their coal emissions quite a bit and they have plans to close their remaining coal plants, which I'll get to next. But uh, they're planning to build out a lot of gas, which is not um, in line with what we need to do. So um, this is sort of just a breakdown of TVA. And, you know, they've got the generation up at the top. That's how the power is made. They've got the transmission lines, which is the, are the big towers you see sort of across the state to transmit the power from the generation generating plants to um, the folks that are going to use it. The distribution level is actually the smaller poles you see in your neighborhoods bringing uh, power to each individual home. And then so they serve direct service industrial customers. They serve members who are in co-ops and they serve sort of municipal utilities like NES in Nashville and KB in Knoxville. Uh, this is just a map and Gil showed the, the service territory too, but this is just um, a breakdown of their current uh, local power companies, which are the entities that they actually sell power to. Um, and they're, you know, pretty distributed around seven states, including um, most all of Tennessee. Uh, and here's sort of some of the, um, you know, the counter to what TVA might say publicly, you know, they're, they're planning to retire their coal plants, um, but they want to replace it with new fossil gas plants, which, um, you know, would continue to emit um, uh, carbon uh, and fossil fuels and, um, and methane, which is counter to what we need to be doing. And they, one of the options was solar to replace those coal plants with, but they, they're really pushing for, for fossil gas instead of new solar, which um, we're certainly against. Uh, you know, they've got a lot of folks have seen higher bills this um this spring and into fall because of um, what's called a fuel cost adjustment, which is a result of uh, a lot of volatility in the fossil gas market um, because TVA does have a lot of gas. So some of those fluctuations in the gas market as a result of global events like the war in Ukraine are directly passed off onto customers. Um, and then, you know, they've got some, some, some fixed fees for solar access as well. Like I think uh, I believe Memphis has um, Memphis's utility charges you about 30 bucks a month just to access the grid for you if you have solar on your roof, which is sort of counterintuitive to, you know, transitioning to renewable energy and, and to rooftop solar. Um, just a little bit about TVA sort of structure. So they have a board of directors, which is the sort of oversight entity over the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, you know, there's sort of a community influence on them with local power companies and, you know, city councils, things like that. You've got sort of like a corporate influence with, um, you know, boards, uh, industrial committees, CEO and staff. Uh, and then you've got some compliance um, from the federal level, which is the TVA Act, which was uh, written in the, the 30s under FDR and the New Deal. You've got the president and Senate, which I'll show on the next slide, actually uh, points to the board. And then you've got legislation at the federal and state level that impacts TVA as well. But um, so this is TVA's current board of directors. As you can see, there are several vacancies. And that's been held up in the Senate because um, there's been some some politicking going on that is, has held up some of these new appointees. Um, and so, as you can see here, we've only got five members on the current uh, nine member board at TVA. And two of them are actually their terms have expired. So at the end of the year, they're going to roll off of the board and the TVA board would be would be without a quorum and unable to conduct any business. So. Uh, thankfully, you know, there are six folks that have been nominated. They, these are those folks, um, you know, we're, we're really pushing, uh, the Senate to confirm these folks. Um, as I said, the, the president, so president Biden nominated folks back in April of 2021, uh, got input from senators. Um, three of them had a hearing in April, um, of this year, actually. And then, uh, at this point, five of them have moved out of the environment and public works committee. And there's only one that's been held up, who is uh, Beth Gear. And so at this point, we're waiting on her to get moved through the committee and hopefully onto a confirmation vote at the full Senate. But it hasn't happened yet. And, um, you know, in the meantime, there's some major decisions that are being made by this gentleman, who's CEO Jeff Lyash. Um, he's the highest paid public employee in the country. Um, he just got a pretty big raise <laughs> and now makes around $10 million a year, um, which is way more than the second highest paid federal employee, which is Anthony Fauci. Um, and the board, unfortunately, has delegated a lot of its authority to Jeff Lyash. So a lot of the decision making around these coal plant retirements and the plan on whether to build out new gas or to invest in things like solar um, is falling squarely on the CEO instead of the board, which is sort of counterintuitive to the way TVA was set up. Um, and just a brief sort of like breakdown of how 
local power companies work. Um, municipal utilities are owned by local governments. So like I said, NES in Nashville and KUB in Knoxville, they're subject to some of these requirements. And then there's kind of an alternative, which is electric cooperatives, which are member owned. And those are usually more uh, commonly found in rural areas. Um, and although Middle Tennessee Electric is one big one in Middle Tennessee. Um, and this is my little video clip, but uh, this is sort of like a, a, a hopeful moment. Um, and like I said, I think, uh, you know, TVA has some some good goals. They've done some good things over the years, but they're also not on track in the way that we need them to be in transitioning to renewable energy. So, um, you know, we as a community do have power. It is a public power entity, even though it's kind of gotten away from that. So uh, just well, the action step that I have for tonight is we've got an action up on um, on our website to encourage the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee and Senate Majority Leader Schumer to confirm all of those TVA board members um, as soon as possible to hopefully get TVA back on track. And you can see the website here. Um, I can drop it in the chat, but it's cleanuptva.org slash actions. You've got a, we've got a little email template you can fill out there and send a message to those senators and uh, hopefully get those folks confirmed and sort of get TVA back on track and back leading the transition to, to, to renewable energy like we know they can. So um, there's my email and I know I'm probably over. So I will stop and hand it back over to y'all. Hey. That was great. Thank you, Brady. And I really appreciate the call to action there and to know that there is something everybody can do to make a difference on this and help uh, influence TVA in the right direction. Uh, but that was great info. And we did have a question. I don't know if, um, if Gil is still around and but there's a good question for him um, bef just to make sure he's coming back. Um, yeah, that was it. Um, but I just want to let everybody know that we will be getting more into the, the direct actions that uh, individuals and residents of Tennessee can get involved in during our forum tomorrow. We have an in-person and virtual uh, combined hybrid meeting taking place tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. with some more great speakers and more about what are the practical steps that individuals can be taking and organizations to advance yeah. some of the solutions we've heard here today, tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so please tune in and go to visit our website, tectn.org, and uh, you can click on the registration link to still get into that. Thank you for popping the website up there. Uh, to participate in that forum tomorrow, you can come for any part of it or the whole thing. I'll be uh, we there. got room. Maris will be there. Yeah coaching us through the process. So we're going to get our really the coach. <laughs> I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> you are good. Good. Do we want to go that. with that question or? Yeah. The, the question was what, and this is for Gil. Um, if he's still on and, and Brady could probably ask, answer this too, but what solar resources are available for Tennessee residents to make that switch? Uh, is Gil, you still out there? Gil? Yeah. Thank you. Gil. Welcome back. Great. Um, for homeowners, there, states and local entities almost never. And solar has gotten too cheap for most uh, states. They pretty much have phased out all their incentives. Tennessee does no longer has any incentives. Federally, though, there is the investment tax credit. Uh, that's uh, 30%. It was, it's, was 26% uh, and going down, but now it's up to 30% and it's permanent for the next 10 years. So that's 30% off the total cost of the system. Um, and that is the, the main incentive uh, for uh, all solar, small scale solar. Does, does the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits, are they, do they apply to solar installations as well once those are available next year? Right. There, there is a host of, of efficiency, electro retrofits, solar in, um, incentives that are part of the new IRA legislation. The Inflation Reduction Act. Many of them complement each other. So I, I'm kind of expecting once those are clarified by Treasury on how to apply for them, and some of the state uh, energy office also has to do some implementation, they will see a lot of companies coming in. So they'll put a high efficiency heat pump in at the same time they can actually redo your some of your electrical wiring and update it which is very critical for adding some of these more advanced technologies including solar so it helps lower the cost and um and and then package solar in that you're also seeing a lot of interest in putting you know ev chargers in so this is all electrical work 
A lot of it now does has complementary incentives. So when you're looking at a home, you might not just be looking at a solar or just a smart you know, thermostat. You're probably looking at multiple technologies. And they all are a little differently. So how companies are going to be able to package them to reduce the overall cost of making smarter, more efficient homes. It's it's a it's a lively this just passed. It's won't even be start be implemented until probably Q2 of next year. Um, you can still do just a straight solar, but solar works best in an efficient smart house. So mm-hmm. thank you, Gil. Yeah. Thank you, Gil. Good information. And and thank you, Brady, as well. We're yeah. gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker. We're moving into we're segueing into a new topic, which is we talked about climate balance and some great solutions and there are more many more solutions out there as well but we're going to move on to the thriving habitats yeah, and our segment. next speaker a topic that's near and dear to my heart um we have kevin botts the director of policy at tennessee wildlife federation and they have a solution to address the plastic pollution and the litter crisis here in tennessee really excited kevin are you there i'm here thank you for having me can you Yay, hear me okay yes we can hear you hey kevin welcome Fantastic. welcome Thank you so very much. Well, listen, I, I appreciate you guys having me here tonight. Um, you know, litter um, is something that most people would not associate with the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. And and, and I'll, I'll get into that and explain that here in just a few minutes, <clears throat> um, because this is really a, a campaign for uh, all of Tennessee and for all Tennesseans. Um, I like to think of us as, as more so of just the stewards and, and creating the vehicle for this campaign. So we got involved in this conversation several years ago, probably about five years ago, um, as we were traveling across uh, the state and meeting with uh, different folks. We were get, hearing more and more often that uh, people that litter was impacting their experiences outdoors. And, and I'm not just talking about, uh, I like to say, the hooks and bullets because I think a lot of folks think of us at the Tennessee Wildlife Federation of just hunting and, and fishing. And that's really not the case. You see, we were established back in 1946. We're the oldest nonprofit conservationist uh, group in the state of Tennessee. And uh, we're there to, we're here to represent, defend, and conserve all the natural uh, resources and assets of the state. So this relates to birders and, and, and everyone, um, hikers, the, the whole nine yards. And so as we were hearing this, we d decided to, to take a deeper dive into our research. And what we really found out is that litter uh, is getting uh, just completely out of hand at all time high. And so we decided that we would get involved uh, with this at, at a legislative uh, level. And the reason being, and I'm gonna show a video here in just a minute, but it's at that city and county level that litter is dealt with on a regular basis. Um, it's up to those city and county governments that are uh, that run very, very tight budgets. Many times they don't have the budgets to put personnel out picking up litter. Many times they don't have the budget to actually have a vehicle to go around and pick up the trash that is picked up uh, off the sides or bagged on the sides of the roads. So we felt like the state needed to get involved and help these cities and counties out, as this tends to be one of the top three issues that these city and county governments are dealing with on a weekly basis. So I'm going to play a video for you guys, and uh, and then we'll come back and uh, and tell you the rest of the story. Tennessee has a problem. There is litter everywhere you look. It's more than an eyesore. Litter pollution measurably damages our nature, our agriculture, our entire economy. The Tennessee River, that ribbon of nature and economic activity winding from Knoxville to Paris, contains more microplastics per gallon than any other studied river in the world more than rivers that travel six times farther or are surrounded by ten times the people. Back on land, our farmers pay the price for our litter every day. 
an estimated $60 million each and every year. A single plastic bag blown into a field can ruin a bale of cotton and damage costly equipment. Livestock is injured or lost when debris is ingested. But no one escapes the costs of litter. Tourism takes a hit when visitors are repulsed by our mess. Businesses looking for a new home with a high quality of life view litter as a clear signal to keep looking. $19 million in tax revenue goes toward litter cleanup and education each year. But the problem is bigger than $19 million, and local governments are left with the tab. Meanwhile, Tennessee manufacturers are desperate for recovered plastics, aluminum, glass, cardboard, and more to make their products and create jobs. That's the reality Tennessee Wildlife Federation has come to see. Litter presents incredible costs and incredible potential. As one of the largest and oldest nonprofits dedicated to the conservation and sound management of Tennessee's great outdoors, the Federation is leading the effort to make cleaner landscapes for the economy, agriculture, and nature. We call it Tennessee Clean. After studying this issue for years, it's undeniable there is incredible anti-litter work being done across the state, but it's piecemeal, under-resourced, and can't keep up with the growing volume of litter covering our land and burdening our city and county budgets. Tennessee needs a unified, comprehensive, statewide solution to make progress. This year, the Federation and the Tennessee Clean Coalition made the first fresh progress on statewide litter control in a generation. Tennessee Clean secured a unanimous vote by Tasser to begin a comprehensive study of litter pollution in the state. Because if we're going to fix this problem, we have to understand it. As the research arm of the Tennessee General Assembly, Tasser will look into topics like the sources and composition of litter, financial and environmental costs, economic opportunities of recovering waste, and so much more. This study will inform how to achieve the four goals of Tennessee Clean. One, recover at least 85% of certain plastic, glass, and aluminum containers that are valuable to our manufacturers and economy when recycled. Two, reduce use of single-use carry-out bags, which are a major polluter of our waters, cause damage to recycling and agriculture equipment, and injure fish and wildlife. Three, implement a statewide program that comprehensively addresses litter prevention and reduction for this and future generations. Four, evaluate existing state laws and rules pertaining to litter for their effectiveness and make recommendations on how they may be improved. Our process for Tennessee Clean is designed to be collaborative from start to finish. Right now, any person can add their voice to say we need to clean up Tennessee. Go to TennesseeCleanAct.org, click Act Now, and take an action. Businesses, nonprofits, and local governments have a big part to play too. We've got to join together to make a change. Join the Tennessee Clean Coalition to amplify the message of Tennessee Clean to say that it's time to end the damage litter causes to your work and our great outdoors. Just go to TennesseeCleanAct.org forward slash coalition to get started. Tennessee has a problem and it's hurting our water, wildlife, and wild places. The solution can't wait. Let's get started. Can everyone hear me again? So that is our campaign. What we want to do is clean up our state. Okay. We want to clean up the state. You know, we have an opportunity to recover this material, uh, as you saw in this video, for a lot of different companies that are have manufacturing plants here, here in the state of Tennessee. And um, I think this is a win-win for our state. These plants get an opportunity to expand their businesses, create jobs, recover and get this product um, 
clean up our state. I think it's a win-win for the state. It really truly is. We're going to be running this piece of legislation here in a couple months in January when the General Assembly reconvenes. And um, it's going to be important for your voices to get heard. I would challenge each of you to reach out to your local delegation uh, now to say, look, there's a piece of legislation coming about litter prevention. And this means a lot to us. And we want to get behind this. We want you to be for this as well. As the video indicated, you can go to TennesseeCleanAct.org. Look for Take an Action. Click on that and then scroll down and sign the petition. And by signing the petition, it does just a couple of things. Number one, it allows you to stay in touch with us via email. So we can update you uh, throughout the campaign of what's going on. But the bigger deal is that you're going to have an opportunity during our calls to action while we're running this legislation. We will email you, notify you. You can simply put in your address and um, a, a little form letter, and it will get uh, get delivered to your to your delegation, to your representative, to your senator, and your, also their phone numbers so that you can actually reach out to their office and make them aware of the bill number and um, and that this means a lot to you and that you'd like for them to vote in favor of passing this bill. So that is our pre that's my presentation. I hope that you guys can get uh, get behind this campaign. And if I can do anything to answer questions, please feel free to, to reach me at the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. That was magnificent. Yes. <laughs> uh, I appreciate a good video, good film, good documentary. And that was a powerful piece you all had there in a, a clear message. So we're going to do our part and we're going to discuss more about action steps and how we can be involved in that campaign uh, during, our for, during our forum tomorrow. And, and we're looking I, forward to that, too. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Excellent. Kevin. Yeah. And uh, we'll certainly direct any questions that people have for Kevin directly to the TWF website. Um, yeah, please do. And uh, thank you, Kevin. We're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, but it's so inspiring to see that there are people working on the, the solutions we need. Oh, and, yeah. And we're going to do it. We're going to win these victories. Uh, and next up, speaking about thriving habitats and things you can do at home right now, we have a, a great speaker who is very, very involved in what's called the UT Smart Yards program. And Andrea Ludwig is a stormwater management specialist with UT Extension. And well will show us what homes are doing to turn yards into habitats. So take it away, Andrea. Fantastic. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Jeff, for the wonderful introduction. And I am so pleased to be with you all. And as Jeff mentioned, we're going to shift gears a little bit into uh, still and thriving habitats, but we're going to talk about what everybody can do right in their own backyard. And so I wanted to share with you all um, about an exciting program that we've been uh, doing at UT Extension called Tennessee Smart Yards and how this is helping to uh, be part of the solution. There's so many great things going on across the state, um, but this is one piece of the puzzle here when we're talking about nurturing these thriving habitats across Tennessee and across our communities. So I know that we don't have to look far to see brilliant ecosystems and brilliant thriving habitats across our great state. Um, I took this picture from the bridge across the um, French Broad River at Seven Islands State Birding Park. And it just, to me, when I think about thriving habitats, uh, you know, this is one of the images that just resounds in my head. And, uh, you know, we can't think about ecosystems and thriving habitats in Tennessee without really thinking about water because we are such a wet state. And so I know my mind is always drawn uh, to these natural water resources we have flowing across our great state. And I actually serve as the state stormwater management specialist for UT Extension. So I am a little bit biased there. Um, but of course, water connects us all. So when we think about thriving habitats, of course, um, we need to think about ecosystems. And of course, an ecosystem is that combination of all the living organisms, but also the non-living environment and this acting as that functional unit. And most importantly, as pointed out in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, you know, humans, we are an integral piece of this. And so we need our thriving habitats to support biodiversity hey, and all Andrea? the wonderful ecosystem services. Sorry to interrupt you. Hey, um, could you go ahead and put your slideshow into presentation mode? Because I think we're missing the progression. 
and just flip through the first slides you showed because your message was powerful and we want to see the images but well um, thank you yes let me try to reshare. I think I might have goofed it up on the front end. Well, we're seeing it if you click through it that way, although it's not, of course, it's in it's in the back end hmm. view, but at least we can see what you're talking about. If you click each slide, oh, where is it? Oh, she's resharing. Resharing. Okay. okay. I think I'm gonna reshare. And pardon the technical difficulties. Thank you all so much. Let's just go ahead and share the entire screen. Ooh, bold, courageous. Dangerous. Dangerous, but we're gonna do it. <laughs> we're gonna do it. How about that? Do it. There you go. Oh, yes. Look at that. <laughs> Thriving habitats. Right thank there. you all so much for the patience. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all so much. So, yes, um, of course, uh, our thriving uh, habitats across Tennessee, it water is an integral piece of that. And when we think about um, preserving these thriving habitats and our natural water resources, um, you know, a lot of that is you know, very um, uh, biasly, you know, for human human uses. So whether it's for our recreation to get out there, go hike in the Smokies, go paddle along one of our great uh, reservoirs throughout our state, or just the basic necessity of having clean water. Um, you know, we depend on these ecosystem services. And this is really what's at the, the I think, the heart of making sure that we've got thriving habitats so that we can support um, these various things, um, as well as all the lovely little critters that uh, find home in these thriving habitats. So of course, um, when we have a, a blossoming uh, population in Tennessee, a lot of people are coming here. I moved here 12 years ago and I love to call it home. Um, so as we see this expansion and growth uh, throughout our state, of course, this presents challenges to some of these thriving habitats. And uh, here we can see in the many different ways that our human imprint on the landscape uh, can result in some challenges uh, to our aquatic ecosystems and just generally our thriving habitats all across the state. Um, one of the ways that we can see how um, urbanization and development uh, has changed our landscape is through a very uh, measured indices here, uh, the impervious surfaces that come along with this development. And so here's just a, a snapshot of our state. The pinker the, the pixel is here, the more impervious that landscape is to, to rainfall. Um, just one indication of how our human imprint and footprint have changed the way uh, that land and water uh, natural balance um, has been thrown off. Another way that we can look uh, to see some of the data that's collected is what is that impact of our human imprint having on um, our water quality in terms of this water quality assessment that our Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation puts out for us every couple years. And I love to use the Google Earth to zoom in to see what are some of the challenges that are presenting themselves in the watersheds across our state. And to me, this presents a lot of opportunity to understand what are those challenges? What are the landscapes that um, are in some of these watersheds that have these challenges? And then how can we match the solutions, the technologies, the, the conservation practices to meet those challenges when they exist. And so here, you know, there's over 85% of our land in Tennessee is privately owned. So we have a lot of residential development, a lot of, um, you know, suburbs and that um, urbanizing landscape, transitional landscape that presents a lot of opportunities. Each individual landowner in Tennessee presents an opportunity because they have the agency to um, make decisions about their landscape, make decisions about what type of practices uh, they implement when they're choosing landscaping and um, the way they manage their land. Um, so to me, this is a, a great opportunity to reach homeowners with education on how can each and every one of us be part of that conservation and stewardship action. So there's nearly uh, over half the streams in Tennessee. Uh, we don't have the people power uh, at TDEC to be able to capture information on all of our 60,000 miles of rivers and streams. But of what we have monitoring data for, nearly 4,000 miles of those Tennessee streams are impaired by runoff from developed land. 
So again, an opportunity, uh, data-driven, knowing what the challenges are, and now we can pick out the best practices to educate our communities and our um, citizens with to try to uh, really combat some of these challenges when it comes to bacteria, sediment, nutrients, and that streamside, um, riverbank, vegetation alteration when these challenges present themselves in our watersheds. So this is coming to uh, our program here, Tennessee Smart Yards. Uh, we've been doing this a while at UT Extension, um, first conceptualized by the Tennessee Water Resources Research Center. Uh, this program was uh, born uh, through a 319 grant from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture back in 2008, before I even had a chance to join, join the effort. So um, I was fortunate to find a lot of opportunity already here when I uh, joined the program in 2010 as the co-director and now serving as the director statewide. Um, we've been uh, talking about homeowners, uh, talking with homeowners, trying to empower them with this message on how can we have stewardship and sustainable landscaping in our own yards, in our landscapes, uh, to be a piece of that puzzle when it comes to protecting these thriving habitats. Um, so over the last uh, few years, we've been adapting these uh, educational materials to meet homeowners where they are. And in the past couple of years, just like so many of us learning from home during COVID, um, our program is completely online now. So any Tennessean can participate and certify their home landscape as a Tennessee Smart Yard from the comfort and safety of their own home, learning from professionals at their own pace. So this is a, a private property uh, education, but home uh, yard certification program for any Tennessean. And we like to say that a Tennessee smart yard is one that is in balance with the local environment to benefit both people and our ecosystem. Um, again, kind of recognizing that, that we are part of the ecosystem and the choices we make are part of that functional unit and keeping Tennessee's land and water healthy one yard at a time. I forgot to mention, pull out your smartphone and, and take a little quick shot of these QR codes as I bring them to you. So uh, a few easy steps for people to participate. Uh, they'll download some resources that we've got on our website. We've got our Tennessee Yardstick Workbook, and then we've got our Yardstick. And our Yardstick is comprised of nine foundational uh, foundational principles of a Tennessee smart yard. So everything from right plant, right place, managing soils and mulch, reduce, use, recycling, watering, fertilize appropriately, managing those yard pests, reducing stormwater and its pollutants, my favorite, of course, um, providing for wildlife and protecting water's edge. Each of these uh, foundational principles of a Tennessee smart yard has a suite of actions, and each of those actions, as homeowners adopt them on their properties, then they collect inches towards their Tennessee smart yard. So we want to recognize that, um, you know, there's a wide variety of, of, of um, experiences and um, goals that folks are going to have as they come to our program. And so really right off the bat, you get two inches towards your Tennessee smart yard for just reevaluating your space, looking to see what types of environmental conditions you have and assessing what kind of management practices you really need in order to meet your goals. So really taking a fresh look at your landscape, you know, understanding, well, why am I choosing to, uh, you know, choose this management? Management, choose this mowing this patch every day when I'm not necessarily playing soccer on it or walking the dog every day? Is there something else I could be doing in this space that might elevate the ecosystem services and function of that space and then meet some of my other goals that I hadn't even thought about? So really just inviting homeowners to um, start this program with a fresh lens um, when it comes to looking at the environment around them and knowing uh, that their practices are really part of the, the ecosystem function. So um, homeowners collect inches, they adopt uh, all, all the practices. There's nine principles, 35 actions out there. So a total of 47 possible inches. And I hope you guys will remember that only 36 inches and you get your smart yard. So again, we wanna make this very flexible, very um, adaptable for any Tennessean to really see the opportunity and um, come with us to, to certify their smart yard. And um, our online modules are taught by our extensions specialists and agents across the state. Um, so we deliver this education through our YouTube channel. There's about five and a half hours worth of curriculum there. And again, I should have mentioned this is all uh, free, uh, of course, uh, funded through state tax dollars, the UT extension uh, delivered to every Tennessean.
So once uh, folks register or certify their Tennessee Smart Yard, they come back to the website, uh, fill out the form, tell us the practices that they put in place, and then we will uh, provide this custom certified Tennessee Smart Yard certificate to them. And then that makes them eligible to purchase a yard sign, which has gone a long way to promoting uh, through their neighborhoods uh, and getting other people to register uh, to certify their, their Tennessee Smart Yard as well. So over the last couple of years that we've had this um, kind of online platform, we've been able to capture a lot of metrics. Um, so we've got our Tennessee Smart Yards dashboard, um, kind of really putting in here an element of where we're seeing these Tennessee Smart Yards popping up. Of course, uh, kind of around these urban hubs that we're seeing across our state. Um, but so far, we've got over 350 across 46 different counties across Tennessee. Really excited about that. And we're collecting photos. So really just trying to capture what people are doing to um, incorporate these smart yard elements, this stewardship and showcasing the, the wonderful thriving habitats that can exist when we take these practices on um, in our backyards. Um, we're also, of course, getting back to, to doing real, real um, in-person uh, programs as well. So be looking for a Tennessee Smart Yard booth at your local farmer's market or at your uh, local county extension office. Uh, a few more metrics we're trying to, to collect here, really showing how our smart yards, what kind of practices are in place across the state, protecting our watersheds. One example here, looking at Madison County uh, in the Jackson area, uh, just trying to connect people with their watershed. This uh, graphic shows you exactly that we've got this smart yard protecting uh, the, the watershed that they're in, the South Forkadier River, uh, I know is pronounced the right way there in West Tennessee, and really looking to see what kind of practices are protecting our watersheds um, every time that they're implemented. And the, the quotes that we're getting from our certifiers are just really heartwarming, um, enjoying observing the changes in the landscape and the increase of biodiversity, um, looking for more ways to become better environmental stewards, and loving creating more uh, of a natural environment in their home landscape. This wordle was made with all of the comments that we've received so far. So uh, I'll leave you with, uh, yeah, this is our goal, smart yards, healthy landscapes, and clean water. It's all connected. And of course, those thriving habitats uh, are a big part of that landscape. So appreciate the opportunity to share this with you all. And call to action would be hopefully visit our website, promote it in your communities, and we'd love to, to hear what you have to say. Awesome. That was incredible. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. I love that you the program makes it so doable, something anybody could take home right now and be the solution that, that is urgently needed across Tennessee. It looks and fun. It's it looks fantastic. Like, it looks like a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. And hang out as long as you want, because we have some great speakers coming up now. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next um, is Janet Boscarino from Memphis. And I've known Janet for about three years because we both sit on the board of directors of a new nonprofit organization known as the Tennessee Compost Team Council, promoting compost as a solution across Tennessee. Nice. And so uh, a lot to do there. And um, so Janet is founder and executive director of Clean Memphis and does an amazing work out there and is also very schooled in the concepts of circular economy. So we're going to switch into that topic and hear what Janet has to share. Awesome. Welcome, Janet, glad you're here. Thank you. Can you guys see me and hear me? Absolutely. Wonderful, yeah. thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here tonight with all these amazing speakers and to talk about such important topics. Um, I lead, as, uh, as you mentioned, Clean Memphis, but we are leading a bigger initiative called Memphis Transform, which is really about accelerating and amplifying efforts for a greener Memphis. And a lot of that is focused on circular economy. So I want to talk a few minutes, a little bit, take a little deeper dive into what circular economy means before we move forward. Um, if you look in the middle of what this uh, butterfly diagram here, um, you kind of look at the linear model that Jeff uh, alluded to at the beginning of, the con of our conversation tonight. Moving there from there is where we extract natural resources, we manufacture products, we transfer those through service providers to you and me, users as con and consumers. We use them and often we recycle them, but more often than not, those just end up in a landfill. When that happens, not only do we lose that product, but we lose all of the natural resources and the labor that it took to bring that product to bear. In a circular economy, in contrast, waste is designed out from inception. It is at the very heart of design is design out waste and to design out pollution. 
Materials circulate without being lost to those systems. Uh, they stay in the system, forming a closed loop, which is why it's circular. Keeping the product in those closer loops of manufacture, reuse, redistribute, refurbish, keeps the product in that circle for a longer time at its highest value before, in, before being recycled. Many people think of circularity as something that's actually new, but in fact, it's really as old as the planet. Uh, nature doesn't waste, it's regenerative. And circularity follows that principle of biomimicry, where we can copy nature and follow that as a solution for what for, our, for a better system around waste. Now, I want to share a few trends that I learned about um, circularity uh, in a conference that I attended some time back. I think they're really fascinating, and they're setting up a, a foundation for the future. The first innovation are, are materials innovation, where we're looking at uh, sourcing materials from fruit and vegetable fibers or biodegradable bioplastics from wastewater and solid organic waste. Really interesting companies coming online like Bolt Threads, who uses something called mycelium to create a leather light product. Really fascinating stuff. The next part is waste collection or logistics systems. They're really driving digital platforms to drive reuse and waste conversion. Uh, if you're familiar with ThreadUp, it's an online um, it's an online thrift store. Uh, so there, and my daughter loves thrifting. So it's a, another way to have that reuse model uh, in play. And then TerraCycle, of course, is really trying to specialize in hard to recycle items and packaging. In fact, I talked to a, a company here locally who was just consulting with them and, and working to change their packaging so that it would be uh, better for the environment and could be uh, handled by TerraCycle. Another uh, trend is in the sorting and treatment of recycling. So this is where we're seeing companies that upcycle, upcycle existing plastics or textile fibers into hard uh, and hard to recycle products into new products. You've probably heard of Rothy's or Allbirds, those fun shoes and bags that you see around a lot of times. So those are new sort of upcycling uh, strategies from existing plastics and textiles. And then the last innovation that was mentioned at this conference uh, is really about uh, business model innovation. That, and that is where we're looking at driving reuse as a business model. Uh, if you're familiar with Rent the Runway, that is where you can rent, you know, a, a gown if you have to go to something, you know, a really nice event. Uh, there are many platforms where you can have rent, where you can rent clothes now instead of purchasing and having to wear them one time and then they sit in your closet and maybe happen, you, you know, landfill them later. Uh, so this idea of having a reuse model is really growing in popularity. Uh, there are many of those out there. If you look around in your city, you can probably recognize uh, reuse models or shared um, models, just like um, using a, uh, we have one called My City Rides, where you can use a scooter. You don't have to own it. You just, it's a shared ownership, uh, like our biking system is here as well. I'm not sure if you've heard of Loop, but it's another example of reuse where you can be a, a member of that. And this, they're focusing more on things like lotions and shampoos and even ice cream and it's reuse packaging. You order it, they bring it to your door, you put it back out, they come and get it. Uh, and so getting away from that uh, linear system to something that's more circular. So I'm really, uh, it's kind of interesting to see these are really systems level changes that are supporting circularity along with policies like extended producer responsibility. That's That policy is gaining some momentum on the West Coast and some in the Northeast where manufacturers, manufacturers are starting to look at their responsibility or to be held responsible for producing materials that are more environmentally friendly, that can function in that circular model uh, and not be harmful to the environment. This really audacious goals for us to set a circular economy goal. It's years and decades in the making, really, but it's encouraging to me that the, to know that there are positive trends uh, supporting a circular future for us. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in Memphis, uh, looking at circularity and zero waste. And what we're doing there, of course, is starting where most cities have to start, where, you know, most cities are looking at their problem of waste, uh, how they're processing it, how what their recycling levels are and what they can do with it that is better than landfilling. So I want to start, I love to start uh, with food, really. I think food is the most uh, when you're talking about circularity, food is the most approachable thing. Uh, I love to start with it. It's like a gateway to circularity. We all eat so we can all identify with food and food can largely be man handled or managed locally. 
So in 2019, along with a lot of partners you see here, we launched the Memphis Food Waste Project. Uh, the goal there is to join the national goal of reducing food waste by 50% by 2030 through source reduction, expanding food rescue and donation, and expanding composting. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Why are we looking at food waste? Uh, probably, you probably are aware, maybe not, that 40% of the food that is grown in the U.S. every year, approximately $220 billion is spent on growing this food, transporting this food, and it ends up wasted. It ends up in our landfills, contributing to methane gas, uh, and it also contributes to a large economic loss. So you have an environmental issue, you have an, an uh, economic issue, and then here in Memphis, we have one in five people who are food insecure. I think the national average is one in eight, uh, but we have a more significant uh, food access problem here. So these three things combined led us to join this uh, national effort to focus on food waste. I love talking about it again because it's so accessible to us. Uh, we worked with Natural Resources Defense Council to look at where we're losing food, uh, where we're losing food by sector. So you can see a large portion of that is in the residential sector where we purchase food, we don't get to it, we don't eat leftovers, a variety of things there. We're also working on strategies with our restaurants and uh, hospitality industry. I'll talk a little bit about more, a little more about that with our Project Green Fork program. But at each one of these sectors, we're building strategies strategies uh, to address and improve either the food rescue, food donation, or composting. Uh, our foundational strategies are based on EPA strategies, so looking to how do we prevent food waste. That's A lot of that is on education, purchasing tips, uh, recipes, inventory control, a variety of things. We launched a campaign called 901 Save the Food that you can follow on Instagram uh, and Facebook. We have chefs showing you how to use all parts of the vegetables. Uh, and giving you really great tips on how to shop your fridge and shop your pantry before you go shopping at the grocery store. Uh, we also just finished a landscape assessment of uh, feeding programs in Memphis, Last Mile organizations, to see what their capacity is to receive more donated food. According to Natural Resources Defense Council, we have about 5,000 tons of rescuable food in Memphis and Shelby County that we're not getting. So now we're making these connections between people who have surplus food and the systems that are um, in place that can take them. So eliminating some of those barriers to receive that food and get it to people who can use it. And then, of course, expanding composting, which is a critical part of being that goalie at the very end to, to capture uh, anything that makes it past the upstream uh, strategies and gets that back into um, get, getting that back in our agricultural community and preventing it from the land from uh, getting into the landfill. I love talking about that because composting really is that perfect circle. Uh, when you're looking at food waste. We're in the Delta, we're an agricultural community. So growing things, getting them to the farmer's market, getting them to the grocery store, to our homes, our businesses, restaurants, and then recovering any of those food scraps uh, and getting that back into a composting system is really a, a perfect example of circularity. So uh, Compost Ferry is a, a nonprofit organization that started in around 2017, I believe. Mike Larrabee was on point to really build a local um, composting program that was residential, worked in our Project Green Fork restaurants, very successful, and in 2020 merged with Atlas Organics. They have now taken over the, uh, the industrial composting, composting operation with the uh, Division of Solid Waste at the City of Memphis and are really growing that. This is sort of a snapshot back in 2021. Uh, I know these numbers have doubled and tripled since we've had uh, conversations last, but as you can see, uh, they're really growing economic impact. They're having environmental impact, creating jobs, diverting waste, generating revenue, and again, keeping that out of the uh, landfill for those harmful greenhouse gas emissions. A word about composting, Jeff mentioned this earlier too. I just want to call out some of our partners across the state. If you're not familiar with severe solid waste, they're like the flagship composting operation for the region. They do a fantastic job there. The compost company in Nashville has diverted over 50 million pounds of organic waste from the landfill. Of course, I mentioned Atlas Organics in Memphis that had, uh, you know, creating some action here along with Compost Ferry. And then as uh, Jeff mentioned, I'm 
happy and proud to serve on the Tennessee Composting Council. It's a statewide advocacy organization that is really trying to expand awareness, access to build markets for composting. Drop the, the uh, website in there. It's a member organization. So uh, if you want to learn more, go there and we'd love to have you uh, at any of the events that we're doing as well. So I want to take a couple of, a look at a couple of other projects uh, in Memphis that are going that I thought you guys might find interesting. The Binghamton Development Corporation, uh, great uh, CDC in Memphis that's really traditionally focused on housing and economic development, has started a job training program and it's looking at hard to recycle items. So they received a grant to get a, uh, a dent to densify foam or a dehydrator and uh, they have begun to accept food service and general extended po uh, expanded uh, polystyrene and they densify that foam and, it, and they create a product that's really like a picture frame or crown molding or base molding. And they have an end user to sell. Actually, they're trying to recruit that company to Memphis so that we can expand and have it all here locally. I think that's a fascinating project and touring their facility is really fun. And I love that it's a job training for people who uh, have either been previously incarcerated or are just trying to get back on their feet. Another project that they're doing is to unlock the scrap value by disassembling lights. They have been awarded a contract with the city of Memphis. They uh, deconstruct all of these lights, recycle the, compos uh, the composite parts uh, instead of these ending up in landfills. And last but not least, Andy Kizzy leads this uh, group. They also are recycling mattresses. So they, they uh, deconstruct them, sell the fabric off and also the coil in the mattresses. Land, uh, landfilling mattresses is not uh, the best option. They take up a lot of space. We were able to connect them with Republic Services uh, and they have worked, and Republic Services manages our landfills here and our recycling MRF. So they were really able to come to, to a partnership uh, that incentivizes people to bring mattresses to BDC uh, for recycling there. We were connecting them with the medical district here, universities where they can generate, where uh, the source or generation of that product can come to them specifically. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, you guys, I don't even have a slide about it because it's so new, uh, but it's another one of our CDC partners, the Work CDC, uh, that, that uh, operate in South Memphis and in North Memphis, and they've done a really great job with housing and sustain sustainable development. They have some fantastic work going on vacant lots where they're planting trees, fruit trees, canopy trees, and stabilizing those lots and uh, preventing illegal dumping and things of that nature. Uh, but now they've just launched the Memphis Urban Wood Project. Uh, its really goal is to create a circular business model based on urban wood reclamation and diverting that wood from landfill. So it's a really exciting project. It's just getting off the ground. Uh, but rather than just the demolition of homes, sort of deconstructing and using that wood in, uh, in construction, uh, it's a really exciting project there. Um, so another couple of things, you know, we do lead the conversation, we convene an advisory group around circular economy here in Memphis, but we are an education organization uh, at our heart. That's really what we do. So uh, I wanted to mention our environmental education program. We actually were, we have three full-time certified teachers on staff that do environmental education in schools. And in 2020, we launched a circular economy curriculum with our schools and a zero waste curriculum. Uh, and the students Students have really been enjoying and loving that. We've done zero waste swaps. Uh, we've had the students doing data collection using an app called Literati, looking at the litter on their campuses and understanding what's recyclable and uh, having other solutions for that. So that's been a really exciting program that we're growing and really leaning into the conversation around circularity with our students. They're the future, the innovators of the future. And so we want them to be well versed in that. I also wanted to mention our Project Green Fork program. Uh, this is where we support our local restaurant and hospitality industry and help them reduce their environmental footprint. Uh, they use green cleaning products. Uh, they eliminate styrofoam and other harmful products. They compost. They have a food donation strategy, and they also recycle. Uh, we have, uh, I think, about 70 Project Green Fork established restaurants, and every year we host an event called Loving Local where we celebrate them uh, and the work they do. They do. We certify them, but they do the work around sustainability and really trying to uh, improve their environmental footprint. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk again about kind of the education aspect and us socializing the idea of zero waste through events and community engagement. Uh, we also have an event called Reharvest Memphis. Our next event's coming up November 17th. And that event is to really highlight food as value. Uh, we have local chefs that rescue food. They rescue a surplus food item. 
Uh, it still has the same nutritional and taste quality, but it's going to be wasted if someone doesn't rescue it and use it. So they rescue food and they make amazing hors d'oeuvres that we sample at, at reharvest. Uh, of course, it's a zero waste event. All of our events that we do uh, are zero waste, which is a great way to have ambassadors out. And when you're engaging with the general public, just helping them understand what's compostable, what's recyclable, why that matters, and how that can really improve our city and our future. And the picture at the bottom I love, it's Drew, who is our, um, kind of leads into our next speaker. He's a local brewmaster. He owns a brewery called Memphis Made Brewing, and I challenged him to make a beer from surplus bread. Uh, I saw that in the UK, someone had done that. And so he did it and uh, made a beer for our event at ReHarvest. It was delicious. Uh, and now for our com upcoming event this fall uh, that we're holding at Grind City Brewing, uh, they have rescued surplus apples from Ripley's Orchard and have made a cider. So again, just this idea of educating, connecting with people, helping them see things in a different way. That's sort of what the whole Memphis Transform campaign is about. Um, I know that environmental issues can be a bit overwhelming and distant at times. Um, but all of us play a role in shaping our environment for the future through every small everyday habits, whether that's refusing something, reducing, using something, uh, composting if you can, to even having a bike share, supporting organizations that do good work. Uh, a cleaner and greener environment is really here for us to create together. Thank you. Bravo, Janet. Fantastic. And I love the beer segue. That's perfect. <laughs> I thought that might be a good tee up. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. That is exemplary of uh, socializing zero waste, actually. Could grab a beer from uh, the Oregon Double Mountain Brewery, who our next guest is uh, co or the owner and founder of. So thank you, Janet. We're going to move on with Matt Swihart, who is also the founder of the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. So Matt, we are stoked to get you on. Thank you. <clears throat> All the way that. from Oregon, West Coast. <laughs> Appreciate the uh, invite, and what a what a great opportunity to speak with a, a diverse amount of speakers. It's just uh, it's powerful stuff. So I'm uh, glad to be a part of it. Um, and just a quick correction: I didn't found the OBRC. I, I joined the OBRC. Oh, <laughs> oh perfect. Well, we're um, glad that you're doing it and that you're going to tell us all about it. Awesome. Um, so I just kind of wanted to go over and give a perspective of uh, you know what some, a small local business could do uh, to drive a circular economy as well. Um, so we started our brewery um, in 2007 and, uh, and really, you know, it's a, it's a pizzeria, we're a brew pub. We wanted to have a beer in a, in a, in a, in a bottle eventually in a package, um, but, uh, but our business took off so quickly in the late 2000s that we were a draft only business. Um, Back in the day, you know, segue back to when I was uh, a college student, um, I'm old enough to have uh, drank beer from a brewery that came in a returnable bottle. So I was always drawn to this nostalgia of people reusing beer bottles um, and as a way, you know, with through a deposit system and a centralized collection and cleaning facility that uh, that you had this uh, total uh, non-waste system. Um, and after yeah, I studied engineering, but after uh, a short career in engineering and traveling the world, it was great to see that uh, those returnable systems were still all throughout the world, uh, ubiquitously uh, in almost every country across the world, uh, a beer bottle is returnable, uh, a Coke bottle, uh, uh, you know, a non-alcoholic beverage bottle is returnable. Uh, and in many countries, the bottle is in fact more valuable than the liquid that's inside of it. And so it really, it really drew that point home of how valuable that container was. And then when I came back from traveling and tried to figure out what my next career was going to be, I got into brewing and uh, I thought, well, that would be the perfect, uh, that would be the perfect uh, container is to bring back, bring back a refillable system uh, in our region in Oregon. And so that's kind of what we did. So, you know, why a refillable bottle? You know, we, uh, um, we were excited about it. You know, I don't know that, uh, my PowerPoint screen's coming up. There you go. That's weird. So do I go, so I've got it up on my screen. Do I need to, uh, share a whole thing? Let me try something here. Is 
technologies. So when I, that doesn't come up when I play it, Jeff. Right. Um, I believe if you want to try to reshare it, um, that's yeah, what. Sorry, sorry for that glitch. I'm that's okay. Stop, stop sharing. No, no problem. We're no here problem. for you. <laughs> I, I could Pardon describe me. what you're looking at. Let's try Stay that. Stay tuned. Again. Yeah, let's While try one more time. While we get to these technical difficulties. Share screen. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. I love your commentary that every, in most countries in the world, the bottle is more valuable than the. The liquid inside it and it and really the, is um so that's huh that doesn't come up let's see well that's yeah but when i take it from there to presentation mode presentation or? huh i'm not seeing that hmm. mysterious sorry yeah, guys. i'm i'm okay yeah um, if we let's just, just do it that way is that all right that's fine it works for okay. me yeah we can all still right. see the information <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. I appreciate your uh, your patience that way. Uh, so we wanted to do a refillable bottle because it uh, it had all the all the things that we had to preserve beer quality and protect the environment at the same time. And so uh, one uh, glass is the best material uh, for for beer uh, to put you know beer in a can. Um, the aluminum will oxidize uh, with the beer and degrades its quality. And so they add a uh, plastic liner inside a, a can and so uh any beer in a can is you know coming into contact with this plastic liner which slowly kind of impregnates into the beer over time uh also a glass bottle uh has a small opening so you get less oxygen into the bottle and that uh, to eliminate oxygen out of the the beer packaging environment um, is a way to uh, preserve its quality um, for the longest amount of time and give it uh, the most shelf life and uh, and our planet is uh, is on fire. I mean, we recognize that uh, climate change is a fact. And uh, here in the West, in Oregon, you know, our area uh, uh, regularly catches on fire. We you know the, we've had black skies uh, late in the season and uh, and been evacuated for our homes. And it's happening nationwide in the hurricanes. And I think we all recognize this as a as a real thing. So not only do governments need to step forward. Uh, but uh, individuals need to step forward and businesses need to take the, uh, the reins by the hand. So that's kind of the whole idea. So I'll try to uh, play this video here. This is a video from the uh, uh, a group called The Story of Plastics, which their goal is to eliminate uh, plastic in oceans, in landfills. And uh, they approached us to, to tell our story. So I thought they do a nice job of uh, what we have. Let's see if I can make that happen. We realized the best environmental solution was. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, I'm really good at this. solution was to refill our bottles over and over again, but we had to figure out how to get the bottles back. we realized we had a chance to go one step further. We saw the opportunity to shift to refillables if we could design a bottle that many breweries could use, but we had to get them on board.
businesses claim to have a green approach, but we wanted our bottle to speak for itself. Our refillable bottle is the green stamp for packaging. Our customers are even now more loyal because of our approach to packaging our beer. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for that. And thanks for bearing with my technology uh, difficulty. Um, so I just wanted to go through a little bit of the comparison between uh, what it's like for an aluminum can and uh, what it's like for a, a bottle of beer in terms of their life cycle carbon. So if you look at the amount of uh, carbon that's generated uh, in a beer package, uh, a PET plastic bottle has a certain amount of life cycle carbon, uh, you know, grams of uh, kilograms of carbon that are emitted per 12 ounce uh, bottle. Aluminum can is a little less um, and a one-way glass uh, in a, a glass that's used one time and recycled a little less, but then you can see all the way over to the right, uh, a refill fillable bottle is somewhat infinitesimal uh, compared to it. It's uh, about 67 times less uh, carbon use than, uh, than a standard aluminum can. Uh, and so that was the benefit. So we, uh, we uh, here's our picture of our, our bottle that we have. It's a 12 ounce bottle. Um, and uh, we also do a 500 mil bottle. And this was a bottle that we uh, developed over time with the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. So uh, back in the day, um, like I said, our brewery was founded in 2007. And then in 2012, um, we added um, a refillable bottle that we uh, that we brought on ourselves. We uh, sourced this bottle out of Germany and brought it over and then uh, set up a, a return system through our distributors um, and then found a cleaning facility up in Canada uh, in British Columbia that was uh, close enough where the logistics all worked out and the and the trucking worked out. And uh, that that we kind of clunked along through that system. Uh, we ran into a lot of uh, adversity and acceptance at the retail level, while the consumers thought it was uh, amazing and excellent. Um, we had a hard time getting the giant grocery chains of the world to sign up to the program. So it, it was quite a struggle. And we even, uh, uh, it was, we were even, you know, th not threatens the wrong word, but we were, it was suggested from the, uh, from the grocery stores that they would kind of stop using our system because they were tired of uh, collecting the glass. Um, but then along came a state incentive um, with the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. And these guys are, it's a nonprofit co-op. It's uh, retailers, distributors, manufacturers like myself that uh, are partnered to manage the Oregon bottle deposit system and the uh, bottle bill, uh, which uh, tries to reduce uh, you know, waste in the landfills in our state. And so their recycling rates were getting smaller and smaller each year. So they approached us with the idea of like, hey, we'd like to uh, adopt your returnable bottle program, but we want to take that glass and expand it so other breweries can use it. So we kind of abandoned my European bottle and then we partnered together to design a glass bottle together. And that was that 12 ounce uh, bottle that I showed you and then a similar 500 mil bottle. And... Uh, and we designed that through a glass company over in Ohio and, uh, and then manufactured that glass in the city of Portland and then went out to breweries and sold it. And so uh, we were one of the first customers. Uh, there are several breweries that have jumped on board. There's about nine of us now. And uh, we're using this common Oregon bottle. Um, we buy the bottle from the beverage recycling cooperative. We fill our beer in it. Um, they've got a bottle drop collection system, uh, which people can return their bottles to, and they separate that from the recycling stream. And uh, then they clean that bottle and then sell it back to us. So it's this wonderful loop uh, that protects that container and, uh, and it and provides an incredible lower footprint. And so what we've done just in over a few short years um, 
we uh, we started with an 11 percent return right before the pandemic we're now up to 34 percent then 36 percent and we've saved up to about a half a million bottles so far and um it's it's there's been a uh, an enormous amount of benefit for us uh we didn't have any supply chain disruptions during the pandemic um we are growing our customer base they're incentivized to come back to be our customers once and again and uh and it seems to be growing and we've had no uh, no shortages of glass so um if you look at the carbon that uh was saved during that time uh there's a chart of if we'd been an aluminum can you can see how high the uh the carbon use would have been for that package uh versus what it was for a refillable bottle and I, I love these little comparisons that you can uh, pull up to what that means. We're a small operation, but half a million bottles is the equivalent of 13,000 gallons of gas, 132,000 pounds of coal. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty cool, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, and that's kind of my pitch. So I think uh, um, I'll leave you all with a picture of my rowdy crew that likes to drink beer. This is one of our Christmas parties. And um, and that's what I have to say about that. I would entertain questions. And thank you so much for uh, letting me join you guys. I hope we can join a future Christmas party. Yeah, I want to go. <laughs> there great. you go. <laughs> and thank you for that. This It's wonderful. We, we were just talking about, uh, as you're giving your, giving your presentation, how do we bring that model to Tennessee? And talking full circle and circular economy, Hopefully the clean act that was discussed earlier will be a way to start to look at some of those solutions and how we can bring them here. Yeah. That, that was the main question. How do we bring it here? How do we bring everywhere. it here? Why aren't be, we doing it everywhere? We will get to a little Q and a, just a brief one after will, um, Sager. I want to go ahead and introduce will yeah. because you know, it, one thing I love about tonight is that we have, we have a number of individuals that, like I said earlier, devoted their lives, their careers to figuring out solutions and implementing solutions in our communities. And Will is one of those and has spent 32 years advocating for better recycling, raising awareness about how it works and showing that it does work in our region. So I'll just go ahead and hand it over to you, Will, the director of the Southeast Recycling Development Council, CERTIC. Thank you. It, um, and I do appreciate okay. being here. And make sure you, um, if you could lean forward a little bit more so you don't disappear into your beautiful background there. <laughs> Perfect. That, uh, that background is a picture I took out of my office window. And I, I learned where the pot of rainbow is. It's not the elusive end of the rainbow, but it actually turned the mountain gold in the middle of winter. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. And I want to talk some more about just the, the economics in our recycling where materials are going and what's happening to it. Uh, I'd like to start off really with uh, the first rule of journalism is to follow the money. Uh, these are the sp sponsors that fund the work that CERTIC does and just like to disclose that so that everybody knows where we're coming from. Uh, CERTIC was formed uh, 17 years ago with the uh, basic mission to unite government and industries to promote sustainable recycling. It came about as a regional concept because in the Southeast, there's a lot of manufacturing consuming material. And I'll get into documenting that in a minute. But at the same time, many of our programs across the region perform very poorly. And these manufacturing facilities are importing their materials from out of state, out of region, and sometimes even out of the country while the material they could be using locally is lost to landfill disposal. Um, recycling has had a run in the news of late. Um, this really started in May of 2018 uh, with lots of stories that were just saying recycling wasn't working anymore. And I've put a lot of energy really into labeling that this is not the truth. Um, a lot of these stories had to do with contract negotiations that were going on between the service provider community as we look at some of the volatility in the market that I will explain um, or, or at least attempt to explain. But uh, recycling actually is a very live and well and running strong. What did happen in 2018 was China put some limits on what they would accept from the United States. Many of the stories that you read uh, 
said that China stopped buying our materials. It was the only market we had. And that's really not true. 70% of all the recycling collected in this country is consumed in U.S. manufacturing facilities. 30% uh, prior to 2018 was shipped overseas, but China was only half of that. And of that 15%, they really only restricted about a half of that. So we were really under 10% for what they were restricting. And most of what had previously gone to China very quickly found its way to Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, later to um, India. But uh, what we did experience was that it went at a lower price. Really counter to everything, and this is kind of a busy slide with a lot of data, but uh, the bottom line is in the year after, after National Sword was passed, we actually exported and consumed more paper out of recycling programs than we did the year before National Sword. So the, the stories that China undercut our recycling programs are, are much in error. It did upset our pricing, and I'll speak to that. But uh, really, at, uh, some of us in 2018 and 19 were pointing towards the demands from China for us to produce better quality materials were having a positive ripple effect throughout the industry. And it actually, uh, the end result has made recycling a stronger industry. What we've got to realize is our recycling when it's generated at our material flow generated from households and businesses, it's being separated from disposal and placed into a chain where it's going to change hands several times. But this is a market that is governed by standard economic uh, factors. I mean, it is a supply and demand market and a lot of things have effects upon our supplies. Just the uh, how much liquidity, how much capital investment is available to take advantage of opportunities where there are good prices. Uh, we've always got to be aware of alternates for recycling. Manufacturers can use virgin material in their manufacturing. Recycling competes with that choice and will we'll always compete with it. The quality we have, currency fluctuations in, in international markets, just a, and the, the list goes on about all the things that can affect our recycling story and our economy. But to get it out of that complexity and just kind of simplify it, just to realize that, that recycling starts when we divert material from disposal. It'll then go through some type of a collection uh, process, at, at whether it's curbside or convenience centers or whether it's commercial collection. From there, it's going to go to a process center where we sort materials out and they're typically then put into bales and ultimately truckload quantities of specific materials are then uh, made available and put on the market where they will go into manufacturing. And at some point um, uh, through the manufacturing process, a recognizable brand is going to acquire that material, whether it's a part of their packaging or part of the product. Um, it is going to find its way back with a brand label on it onto the retail shelf and there the consumer will repurchase this product as it's made the full circle. Um, what is frequently not watched in this is that as the materials moving in that clockwise fa fashion, other than the consumer depositing material to his recycling program, everything along this process is a business to business exchange. It is a value chain uh, and the material value increases as it goes around the chain, but in the dollars uh, collected at retail, back through wholesale distribution and back to brands and manufacturing, go, uh, go back. And sometimes we don't see the money make it all the way back to the curb then to pay for the truck that's collecting the material. And that leads to some um, choices we have to make about how we get this material into the market. And we need to recognize that we're, and my slide won't advance. There we go. We need to recognize 
our materials are going into some very volatile markets. Uh, these is, this is about 16 years, 17 years worth of pricing for PET or soda bottles or clear HDPE milk jugs and our, the colored HDPE, which would be a lot of the other products on the shelf that uh, soap and detergents, other materials come in. And you can see these products can go from, you know, as low as five cents a pound and all the way up to 40 cents a pound for PET. Uh, and sometimes these swings are very dramatic. Um, we, we watch this across that. The clear HDP has been a little more stable. These are your milk jugs. But even that, we, we watched last year some very erratic and very, a lot of demand for that. Um, our paper products, is, is this not advancing? Uh, there is OCC and is old corrugated cardboard. Uh, cardboard is really the mainstay of a lot of recycling programs. There's a lot of OCC that goes through our system and it, it typically has a value. The average value for the 17 years is right around a hundred dollars a ton. Uh, so that um, makes those loads going down the highway worth over $2,000 in the material that's there. And that that's, uh, helps our system a lot, but you can see even that uh, has its peaks and valleys and some of them very direct. Uh, I wanna just touch on, you know, why is this? And, you know, if you will go back to Econ 101 where we talked about supply and demand, we got to realize our supply is generated by homeowners and businesses that aren't really following the value of the materials. They're making a decision to separate material from disposal and into recovery. They're putting their product, their spent packaging and containers into a recycling bin or program. They're not paying any attention to what's going on in China. They're not paying any attention to what's happening to energy prices or oil uh, the value of oil, anything like that. So when we see the change in uh, demand as when China pulls out and we saw prices drop, uh, we just it's a very small amount of the quantity recycled got changed, but the price swing was large. And that led, and that's why we have all that volatility. Uh, in the meantime, you know, it's our manufacturers like it when the price goes down, uh, but they, you know, continue to look and consume the material. This is a map that resides on the CERTIC website where we've identified 360 manufacturing facilities in the Southeast that are consuming recycling products for in the production of consumer goods. And the uh, quote there on the left from a professor at the College of Charleston is uh, pointing out that we know recycling is good for the environment, but recycling is making a significant contribution to the economy in our region and across the country. But looking specifically at the Southeast, the data behind that map is in the table on the left and that's 362 manufacturing facilities employing 90, almost 98,000 employees and uh, $43 billion of sales coming out of there. That's just the manufacturing sector. Feeding that, there's a lot of processors along the way, the sorting that goes on in our material recovery facilities, the truckers hauling materials to these, and some intermediate processing before the materials get to manufacturing. And that data is captured by the Institute for Scrap Recycling Industry in the table on the right. And again, looking at there, they've uh, identified in our region over 100,000 jobs uh, and again, uh, another 40 some odd billion dollars that impact is going on with our economy. So this, I mean, there's, when you're going to the trouble to put your recycling out separate from your waste, you're feeding an ex extraordinary strong industry in our region uh, that is there. Part of the material flow to get to there goes through our MRF infrastructure. 
Uh, that's the material recovery facilities where the truck that picks your recycling up from your home or business will typically take that load to be sorted and processed. Um, summer before last, we uh, gathered a list of the major MRFs across the region identified here, and we surveyed them for what was going on in their operation. Uh, one of the things that we checked was what is the worst contamination they see? Far and away, it was film entanglers. And the photo you're looking at there is what film and string and Christmas lights and extension cords, other things. Um, I don't see any Christmas lights in this picture, but it was just the wrong time of year. Uh, this is what happens when film goes into the MRF and it just wraps around the equipment. The whole MRF will have to be shut down for 30 minutes to an hour while uh, the laborers will go into there with utility knives and cut all of this stuff off and put the MRF back operating again. And it's an, an extraordinary burden. So we really are encouraging our local programs and our messaging across the region to keep the film and the things that tangle strings, cords, um, uh, but keep this film out of our system because it really doesn't help. Uh, we looked at the state of what's going on in the MRFs and investments are there. We looked at whether there's excess capacity and most of the MRFs were reporting that they are working under their design capacity. Uh, there is a lot of capacity for separation that's uh, out there and available if we can feed more material to it. So we're very optimistic if we can improve our capture rates in our recycling programs, we have the capacity to get this sorted, bailed, and into those truckload quantities and on to uh, the manufacturers. We also looked at what uh, equipment's uh, out there and available, and it, it's really interesting to watch how that has changed over the years. Optical sorters are very common now, um, 20 years ago, a magnetic separator was about the only automated equipment you would find in a MRF. Everything else was uh, hand sorts, but disc screens came along. We've got cyclone separators, which are cleaning up glass um, equipment, and there's still some handwork going on out there in the MRFs. But a lot of that has become automated, and some of it even moving into robotics. And I've got one picture at the end. But uh, I know we're running late, but just some issues that we face in our industry. Uh, one, and I'm open with, is the misinformation that recycling's not working. Um, our recycling industry is very strong. We've got lots of demand for material, and we are looking to seek to, if we can improve our capture rates for our materials. Contamination bogs our system down. It's it's like it adds cost to the system, and um, and that uh, impacts our efficiency. So we we are working on improving our messaging, uh, the messaging across the the state of Tennessee as well as the rest of the region is very fragmented. I know the Tennessee Environmental Council has done some work on Recycle Right Tennessee. CERDIC has also done some work in this space. The Recycling Partnership is working there. TDAC's working there. We really, uh, many of us working to get the message to the homeowners so that we can understand what goes into the bin and what should not go into the recycling bin to improve the efficiency and re or reduce this contamination and improve uh, the efficiency. We've got a lot of communities uh, where recycling access isn't as uh, readily available as waste access, and that certainly hampers the effectiveness. Uh, we're releasing a study in the next couple of weeks across the region of how well some programs are performing. Uh, I'll tell you, Tennessee actually did fairly well in that report. Uh, but uh, we get to some of the other states in the region and we've got some broad areas in our rural communities where there is no recycling access. Um, other factors that are facing us, just what different MRFs can handle, uh, that impacts what different communities can recycle, that then those differences add to the confusion we've got out there. We're working on that. 
uh, as we deal with the volatility of the markets, the MRFs frequently have to go back to local governments with a uh, price change for processing services. Uh, that doesn't always fit in the timeline for the local budget, uh, local government, and their their budgets are already strained. Uh, and we saw some very specific strains hit local governments with sales tax revenues being cut back somewhat during COVID. And so we, um, Recycling World's got a lot of headwind, but at the same time, we have an underlying strength. Uh, in the demand for materials. So I'm very optimistic about where we're going. I am further encouraged by the brand commitments that have come out in the last three or four years. Many brands are talking about increasing their post-consumer recycled content, PCR. Some of them setting 50% goals. Some of them 100% goals for PCR content. Uh, some of those companies are listed here, but this is a very short list of a, a large number of companies setting some very aggressive goals that uh, within the next uh, seven or eight years are going to provide a lot of opportunity for our material to be consumed. Uh, that's going to be driving up the demand. Uh, that's going to help our pricing, but uh, we are going to have to figure out how we feed that and improve that. Our participation has to improve. Um, We've got to look at some of the packaging needs to be designed better for recycling. We've got to design our collection systems so that they uh, parallel our waste disposal systems. It, uh, we need the opportunity to divert material for recycling anywhere we've got the opportunity to throw away waste. We've got to make sure that then our citizens know what to recycle and what not to recycle. We're working on the industrial side to have more and more of our packaging designed for recycling, to remove some of the things on certain packages that make it harder to get there um, because it's uh, then it's going to go through our mechanical process. And this is just a couple of slides of some of the equipment. Um, I had mentioned robots have come into our MRFs and this arm moves at the rate of about 80 picks per minute that it can cycle, pick up something and put it in one of four different hoppers, depending on what it's looking for. Uh, and they, meaning it can separate four different commodities from one station. The robot never gets sick. The robot doesn't take holidays. These robots work very well and they are very quickly being installed in our MRFs around the country. Uh, and what's amazing isn't that arm that's picking up that flattened soda bottle there, but the uh, camera in front of that station where the artificial intelligence is looking for what's on the belt and communicating to that arm where to go and pick it up as it goes by. This AI is continuing to evolve. It's getting smarter and smarter. Uh, it's improving the efficiency of our MRFs. It's improving the net capture that we get from the material going through there. It's having a huge uh, uh, impact in how efficient our programs are becoming at that point. Efficiency matters as we look at developing markets. Uh, CERDIC's been very involved in market development. Over the last several years, uh, we will continue to be so. The things that we need that we see to work on are the efficiency of our programs. Uh, Tennessee's done some good work, particularly in Southwest Tennessee in developing hub and spoke processing where several communities are using the Chester County Material Recovery Facility. This is reducing cost for everybody. We uh, see a lot of opportunities for advancing policy. And uh, measurement, I talk about this largely when I'm speaking with others in the industry, but we've got a long way to go. Again, Tennessee does a good job of local governments reporting to the state how much material they're gathering for recovery, how much material they're disposing. But again, in several other states in this region and beyond, uh, that information is not available. It's extremely hard to make plans and move programs forward when you don't know 
what your data is. Lastly, last uh, November of last year, the EPA released a national recycling strategy for as long as we've been involved in recycling in this country, the EPA just last year has finally produced a strategy. There was four years of work went into developing this strategy. Uh, I was fortunate to be one of the uh, contributors adding comments as that process went on, but there are five uh, objectives listed there um, to improve our markets for materials, improve the capture, reduce contamination, support policies, and again, measurement matters. And we've got to make sure that we're measuring what we're doing, doing or we will never really know if we've improved what we've done or not. Uh, and lastly, a quote from the EPA administrator, uh, Michael Regan. Uh, we're particularly proud of him here in my home, North Carolina. It did, he did hail from here and was the secretary for our Department of Environmental Quality before he was called two years ago to, or a year and a half ago to go to DC. Uh, but he is uh, quoted there. I will leave that with you. And our contact information is here. Uh, I don't know if Jeff's doing questions or where we're going from there, but thank you very much for your patience and listening to me this evening. Thank you so much, Will. That was yeah. fabulous. And you know what I would love to say is that uh, you, I love your spirit of optimism. After working 32 years in this field, you still feel you see that there's hope and there's uh, the solutions are being advanced and they are expanding. So uh, I appreciate that. Thirty three now, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that first one there. <laughs> that first year in your career. <laughs> um, yes. We're getting we're getting older quickly. <laughs> and we had a couple questions come in, but because we're behind, I'm going to forward those directly to the speakers uh, that um, they apply to, and uh, th uh, that way uh, that that audience member can have their questions answered by the speaker directly um, later, probably tomorrow. We'll yeah, we'll over. make sure it happens. Yeah, we have a ton of uh, speakers to come tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, this is not over. And w if you circle back to the first speaker, Amory Lovins, and listening to everything all the speakers have had to say from then till now, one thing I noticed is that they all showed that the solutions are out there. They're yeah. happening yeah. Uh, in some cases on a broad scale and yet there's more we can do and that's why we need to continue having these conversations and the question tonight is what can you do those of you in the audience how will you be the solution and we i have a few things to close on as we wrap up our evening mm -hmm. and one is that we want you all to go out and vote of course mm -hmm. that's one of the easiest one of the things that's readily accessible happening now vote in this election yes vote. and visit our website uh, aaron will put that back up there i did want to say thank you to explore for letting us use our um, this their studio here and for doing an excellent job on the tech to get all these speakers and explore will be also facilitating the technology tomorrow if you can tune in another solution is tune in tomorrow to our forum where there's going to be more interaction smart yeah and a chance to take some of the ideas we learned here and some more we're going to learn tomorrow and figure out what we can do personally to advance those solutions in our lives and in our communities. Yeah. So that's going to, coming up tomorrow. And I, what I want to close the evening on is a short video. It's 90 seconds. And because often when we talk about the great challenges of our day, the, the record wildfires, the hurricanes, and the microplastics that are contaminating our, our entire globe, the loss of pollinator habitats, all these things are massive in scale. But there's something we can all do to address all of those and be the solution in regard to each of those. And that's where the solutions on the global scale will come from, us taking part in that. But I have proof that when you do dedicate a portion of your life to being that solution, you will see the world transform and change. And that's what this short mm -hmm. video now will show. And so, Maris, you want to say goodbye to our audience? And because once the video is over, then we are done for the evening. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having having me. It was great to be here. And I will see you guys tomorrow for sure. Excellent. Make sure you visit our website so you can join us tomorrow. You can click, still click to register for the forum tomorrow. Get out and vote. 
and enjoy Grand this boat. short video that shows the transformation of what is possible from some of the work we've done with Tennessee Environmental Council. Yeah. And I won't steal the thunder, spoil the surprise, um, but go ahead and roll that video, Aaron. For the past 20 years, Tennessee Environmental Council, a nonprofit organization, has been planting trees along Grassy Branch Creek and working with the local HOA, Wingate Estates, and numerous community volunteers to restore this important stream in Spring Hill, Tennessee. This short montage shows the change over that time using Google Earth satellite images to show the transformation of the land and the creek. Twenty years ago, this was a barren landscape, and Grassy Branch Creek was in bad shape. But watch what happens. This same transformation is possible anywhere in Tennessee. If you want to find out how, please contact us. We are here to help.